Yes. Members, the Right Honourable, the Lord Mayor. City of Adelaide Council meeting on Tuesday, the 10th of November, 2020. The Lord Mayor is in the chair. This council meeting will be streamed live and report, recorded for publishing to the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording is being taken of this meeting. This means that your presence at and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or published publicly by the council, including transferring outside of Australia. I also advise that due to a planned statewide outage one of our, on one of our cloud links, the live streaming is likely to cease from 11.30 p.m. tonight. <laughs> Acknowledgement of country. Council acknowledges that we're meeting on the traditional country of the Kaurna people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respects to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land and acknowledge that they're of continuing importance to the Kaurna people living today. We also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present today. Council acknowledges the vision of Colonel William Light in determining the sites for Adelaide and the design of the city with its six squares and surrounding belt of continuous parklands, which is recognised on the National Heritage List as one of the greatest examples of Australia's planning heritage. Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask your blessing upon the works of the City of Adelaide. Direct and prosper its deliberations to the advancement of your glory and the true welfare of the people of this city. Amen. Will all present stand in silence in memory of those who gave their lives in defence of their country, at sea, on land and in the air. Tomorrow is Remembrance Day, marking 102 years since the end of World War I. On the 11th of November 1918, the guns of the Western Front fell silent after four years of continuous warfare. During that time, more than 330,000 Australians served overseas and more than 60,000 of them died. We will remember them and all those who have served in our armed forces. Thank you, members. <laughs> members, that takes us to item five on tonight's agenda, which is apologies and leave of absence, of which we have none. Um, item six is the confirmation of minutes from the 13th of uh, October, the 20th of October and the 3rd of November. I look for someone to move the minutes be accepted. Thank you, Councillor Kouros and a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Mackey. Members, any comments? If not, back to the move to sum up. To the vote, members, those in favour, those against, that is carried. Um, members, there are no deputations granted at the time of the agenda. Um, please speak note that I did actually receive two a requests for it to be heard tonight uh, that I have declined. One was from Nasser Usmani, who wished to address the Council on general environmental and health issues not related to council business. 
and one from Greg Griffin that was received today outside of the timelines, uh, which is regarding bikeways, uh, again, not listed on the agenda, um, who was happy not to attend when advised and will probably come back in December when it is on the agenda. Um, so thank you, members. Uh, there are no petitions uh, this evening. Um, members, I'm going to call uh, items to see if we can move them on block noting. I think there's about 12 reports that are for noting in the agenda. Um, if I can ask you to raise your hand if you want the report to be pulled out. Um, 9.1, which is the advice of the Park Plans Authority. Councillor Martin. 9.2, the advice of the recommendations of the Audit Committee. Councillor Martin. 10.1, City of Adelaide Dis Disability Access and Inclusion Plan. 10.2, the Safer City Action Plan Annual Report. 10.3, the Adelaide Aquatic Centre Future Options. Councillor Martin. 10.4, Golden Wattle Park. Councillor Donovan. 10.5, Cityscape Park. 10.6, Permit Fee Model Review. 10.7, Investigation of Subsidy Program for Retail and Hospitality, Council Kouros. 10.8, Business Advice, Deputy Lord Mayor. 10.9, Quarterly Forward Procurement Report, Councillor Martin. Uh, members, note 10.10 .10 has been withdrawn. 10.11, Outcome Funding and Resourcing. 10.12, Cultural Strategy Refresh. Deputy Lord Mayor. 10.13, Tamashanta Place Partial Road Closure for Dandania's First Nations Hub. 10.14, Proposed Event in the Adelaide Parklands Groovers in the Pod. 10.15, Members has been withdrawn. 10.16, Resource Recovery Strategy and Action Plan. 10.17, Hutt Street Centre, Deputy Lord Mayor. 10.18, quarter one, uh, 2020, 2021 quarter finance report. That's for Martin. 10.19, no, we won't withdraw it. I'll call it anyway. <laughs> yeah. Could I ask that the, um, the 10.19 be brought forward earlier in the... Well, I'll complete this and we'll see how many we can get through. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Um, uh, 10.20, the review of confidentiality reports. Sorry, was that Councillor Martin? Did you have your hand up for that one? 10.21, uh, Chair of Core Committees, Deputy Lord Mayor. 10.22, uh, Progress of Motions by Elected Members. Um, and 10.23, which is the amendment to Adelaide Economic Development Charter. Members. Um, I would like someone to move the following reports be moved on block. I've got 10 10.1, 10.2, 10.5, 10.6, 10.11, 10.13, 10.14, 10.15, 10.16, 10.22 and 10.23. If I could have a mover, thank you, Councillor Abrahamsaday, and a seconder, Deputy Lord Mayor. Uh, Councillor Abrahamsaday, did you respect okay. no members? If not, to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Thank you, members. That takes us back to the agenda 9.1. Councillor Martin. Um, yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, look, I, I am speaking to this, noting that it is a matter that is now going to public consultation, um, uh, because uh, members of my community asked me to speak about this matter. Um, it is something that has occupied them for the past six or seven years, having written countless letters, made six deputations to APLA, taken in various consultations, uh, that taken part in various consultations that included the marking out. Sorry, I, I will look. Are you moving the recommendation? And I'm looking for a seconder. Yes, I'll, I'll move it. Move the recommendation, no. and I'm looking for a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Sorry, um, Councillor Martin. Thank you. So, uh, Lord Mayor, uh, residents have been um, involved in this process uh, for quite some years and were somewhat relieved three years ago 
uh, almost to the day when this council resolved to require uh, this facility uh, by Prince Alfred College to provide a detailed building concept with its footprint beginning at the site of the current club rooms, a draft lease agreement with Prince Alfred College and an information paper on minor landscape and access improvements to be tabled at the authority. Now, that requirement for a building beginning on the footprint of the current building has never been rescinded. It is our policy position. And yet, as uh, the papers uh, will disclose, at APLA last week, they agreed to allow the building to be plonked in full view of all at Park 9 because PAC, and I'm quoting, the old collegians has indicated they will not consider an alternative location for the building that they have designed as it incorporates a social space to enable viewing of the oval from this space and other undercover areas. And uh, my residents argue that's what it's always been about. Uh, there is no community use in this facility. It is a facility for people to watch footy and have a drink as they do so. And the conditions that have been imposed by APLA fall short of what the community was expecting. Uh, they saw that the administration recommended that uh, the liquor license for these premises be applied for just one hour after the cessation of sport. APLA overturned that, I think, on the recommendation of the Deputy Lord Mayor, if I'm correct. And uh, in addition, uh, overturned the administration recommendation that the footprint should be restricted to 375 square metres and extended that up to 400 metres. Not including the decking, which is not included in the total, which by my estimate is somewhere near an additional 200 square metres. Now, uh, the residents would have supported APLA and this decision had it been for what was proposed by the administration, 375 square metres, one hour of licensed drinking after sporting events uh, or indeed training. And it may, it may also include training, I can't work that out. But uh, nevertheless, uh, my residents are saying that this is a decision they do not support and they cannot understand why APLA, it is allowed to make a decision which is in complete uh, contravention of what the elected body decided three years ago. Um, the residents feel like they've been worn down and they have lost all faith in APLA and in this council. Lord Mayor, uh, this is really a crisis of confidence for APLA um, in my part of the world and in many parts of the city. Council, oh, Councillor Moran, your second has left the chamber. Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, you're seconding. Uh, did you wish to speak? Uh, yes, yes, I did. Just wanted to correct the record. Um, Councillor Martin, uh, the imputations from his speech, the, the imputation is that this is final, this is not final. The council has not made a decision on this. The council is the approving uh, authority with regards to developments on the parklands, changing in the parklands. It's the, the CEO that is actually going to be responsible for executing the lease agreement, which means it needs to come through to council for approval. Um, what APLA did do uh, was it uh, said to the administration, we think you can go out to consultation on this. And just to correct the record, Councillor Martin, the motion that I originally moved, which was then varied by my seconder, was actually for 375 square metres. It was not for the 410. Um, but it was very clear in the room uh, that Apple would not have supported that and for procedural ease. Um, I allowed that variation. Um, and I'd also like to remind Councillor Martin that the only reason um, there is or there was a, a one hour firm cutoff uh, proposed in the lease agreement and the CLMP was because I flagged that when it came to Apple last time and said that this is a grey area which must be tidied up uh, so that residents and the club themselves uh, can have uh, certainty around knowing when they're allowed to do what. Um, now, I would have been happy with that, but, but again, APLA um, had, had suggested that rather it would be better to consult on something that was slightly more and closer to what the proponent requested and to see what the consultation uh, said um, than it would be to go consult on slightly less 
and then be faced with this conundrum of what do people actually think of the large one. And I fully appreciate um, and I'm in constant contact with the residents that are affected by this. And I think the council chamber should absolutely take note of their views because I think they are valid. I in particular um, uh, am, and am quite concerned about the, uh, the noise report that was received. Um, I think there was inadequate work done there and if members go through the links they'll see that um, actually it was uh, only, it was based on the assumption that there were two teams operating on the oval when in actual fact we know um, moreover that the noise will be produced by the other community members, the families, the volunteers and others who are present and perhaps barracking and so I think that report needs some extra work done on it um, and I, my request um, that report will be provided for this subsequent consultation. Um, I don't think this is a crisis of confidence and I would really encourage Councillor Martin, just as I've encouraged the members of the community to take part in this subsequent consultation. And I acknowledge that there is uh, a bit of grind in this process, um, but with, uh, with, with one's APLA hat on, when you're looking at usage of the parklands, you're looking at increasing participation in sport, you're looking at providing a community space um, that can be used outside of those times. Uh, I think it's very clear why it was a unanimous decision to go to consultation on this um, by the Parklands Authority, which of course uh, far you know, outweighs now with experts than it does representatives um, uh, as they are. So uh, I think this is worthy for consultation, but I would suggest to councillors that when it comes back, you put your councillor hat on and think about okay, that's good for the parklands, but what about what's inside the city streets, um, uh, which is obviously where the residents' concerns come into it. So I uh, just wanted to correct the record on those few things, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Members, any other speakers? If not, go to the move to sum up. Yeah, Lord Mayor, look, uh, I hear the conciliatory tone, but I read the minutes, and the minutes say Deputy Lord Mayor proposed. And for whatever reason, uh, the fact of the matter is, we now have, going out to consultation, a proposal for a, uh, a building uh, which the council by resolution decided should not be where it is, uh, which will operate despite the administration's uh, uh, recommendation for two hours after the conclusion of football matches or other sport, and uh, which will be significantly larger than what the administration recommended. And moreover, there is in the papers provided to APLA on the occasion of the meeting last week and on previous occasions, absolutely no community use identified, none whatever. It is just devoid of that. Uh, and in fact, the only concession to community that, I, as far as I can see, the uh, PAC group makes is to allow a, a group from Walkerville to use uh, the Oval on occasions. Um, it is going to turn into a, a bit of a bun fight with the locals. Um, they feel their amenity has been compromised and they feel also that the parklands have been compromised because there is now a very large building with a very high roof in the middle of the parklands, quite visible from the roadway where previously there had been the opportunity to place one discreetly at the side of Lundy Road. Um, Lord Mayor, I will take up the, uh, the Deputy Lord Mayor's invitation uh, and uh, seek to amend this when it comes back to Council in line with the resident's wishes uh, and uh, judging by the conciliatory tone, I look forward to his support. Members to the vote, those in favour, those against. I'm sorry, Councillor Moran, when you left the room. As the second, yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry, members, those in favour, those against, that's carried, thank you. Uh, that takes us, members, to item 9.2, which is the advice recommendation of the audit committee. I look for a mover. Councillor Martin. And a seconder, Councillor Knoll. Councillor Martin, did you wish to speak to it? Uh, look, just two quick questions, Lord Mayor. The first is that there's a, um, a couple of reports here that have never been presented to Council. And I wonder, is the administration going to present to us the service demand management update that shows a decline in requests for services uh, to Council by 20%? And, uh, a council response time to emergencies such as spills, damage, ro damages uh, to roads and footpaths that can be seven days, uh, but is a median two days. Um, will that be provided at any stage? CEO.
Through you, through you, Lord Mayor. Look, um, we anticipate doing some further work on our service levels and coming back to you in the new year as a standalone uh, matter anyway. So that would be something we'll be looking to do. What was the other one you mentioned, Councillor? Uh, there were two reports. One is the uh, um, service demand management update and the measuring of organisational performance. Yeah, we can do that as one report. Claire, you might want to just clarify. Uh, through the chair. Um, Councillor, that was one report in relation to um, the specific role of audit committee um, to have oversight of service planning. Uh, we also included um, a draft framework in relation to our corporate reporting. Um, what I'd propose to do is um, bring back a revised service directory as a result of the recent restructure and depending how consultation goes and where that lands. Um, bring, bring back a revised service directory to Council and um, workshop that in the new year at the appropriate time and also talk to council members around service levels for each of those revised services um, as part of next year's business plan and budget process. That's the plan at this stage. And just one final question. Uh, noting the audit committee's pre-eminent position as financial advisor to the council uh, and the body to which the organisation always seems to refer matters for consideration. Um, can I have some advice about whether the following words from the audit committee resolution say anything further than they do. Um, the committee notes that exceeding the budget deficit of the year is not considered financially prudent. That is the budget deficit we're exceeding by uh, some $3 million according to the most recent update. Um, well, I would say that the recommendation is a recommendation. CEO, any comment on that? Through you, Lord Mayor. No, nothing, nothing more I would add to that, except for that we're intending that the Chair of the Audit Committee will come and present to Council in due course. So, so that's not ringing any alarm bells for the Administration or the Lord Mayor or anyone else? That's not the question, Councillor. We're actually noting a report um, from and a recommendation from the Audit Committee. Well, I'm addressing the recommendation from the Audit Committee and the Audit Committee says there's financial imprudence at, at uh, play in Council. I'm just wondering, is it ringing alarm bells? CEO, would you like to answer? Through you, Lord Mayor. Look, um, all I can tell you is that we are intending to convene a workshop um, where the Audit Committee care, Chair will come along and we will have a conversation at that time. Thank you. Councillor Canal, did you wish to speak? Members, not to the move to sum up. Councillor Martin, to sum up. Sum up. Members to the vote, those in favour. Those against, that is carried. Um, now, Councillor Moran, I believe you need to leave early this evening. I've just got out of hospital for a minor procedure. I'm sort of a bit faint, but I would like to be here for the, I'll, I'll put my motion on notice on notice for the next meeting, but I would like to be here for the vote. Thank the you. Meeting. Members, with, with leave of the chamber, could we please bring our 10.19, which is the position deputy Lord Mayor forward? Um, could I just have a show of hands if everybody's happy to bring that forward? Thank you very much. So we will go to, um, um, and Councillor Moran noted that we'll move your um, motion forward. Um, so if we could bring 10.19. Uh, uh, so first the procedural, if I could have a mover and a second to thank you Councillor Sims, seconded by Councillor Moran. Um, it's a procedural members to the vote. Those in favour, those against. Um, I go to the floor. I look for nominations. Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. I'd like to nominate Councillor Kouros. Councillor Kouros. Do you accept the nomination? Thank you. Deputy Lord Mayor. I was going to do the same. Members, any other nominations? Councillor Abraham's yeah, name. Can I nominate the current Deputy Lord Mayor? You can try, but I'll gracefully decline. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Members, are there any other nominations? Um, Councillor Caross, I do need you to leave the room for the vote. Um, uh, members, I need a motion. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor, to appoint Councillor Caross as uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, seconded by Councillor Moran. Did you wish to speak to it? Um, just very briefly, Lord Mayor, but a question. Is this the first time there's been a female Deputy Lord Mayor and a female Lord Mayor? 
Okay. I hadn't had time to review the I list earlier. I am not sure. Actually, Councillor Moran. I was Moran, a female deputy lord mayor when there was a female mayor. No. But Which, it's the first time this century. First time this century. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, this decade. <laughs> Sorry. Well, can I just say I'm very pleased we're repeating that feat, um, and I'm very pleased that it's uh, all on merit. Um, I think Councillor Gross will do a fantastic job uh, as Lord Mayor, and uh, I hope uh, she will be a strong committee chair and will rule the committee um, uh, in, a, in an appropriate manner to ensure that everyone keeps on track. I know it can be hard sometimes, um, but no, by and large, very, very pleased uh, to support this and to support her as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Councillor Moran, did you wish to speak? No. Members, to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? Could I have that? recorded as unanimous. Um, if we can ask Councillor Kouros to come back in. Uh, members at that juncture, um, I will wait till Councillor Kouros comes in. Councillor Kouros, congratulations. You are our new Deputy Lord Mayor. Well done. <laughs> and members, I would like to thank our outgoing Deputy Lord Mayor, uh, Councillor Hyde. I'm going to, sorry, and it's going to take me a while to change the titles, as it does when we change over, uh, for his uh, work in the last year and support of me as Lord Mayor. Um, members, if we can thank Councillor Hyde for his work as Deputy Lord Mayor. Thank you, members. Uh, that takes us to... Um, we will celebrate when we get to Christmas dinner. Um, that takes us to uh, report 10.3, members, the Aquatic Centre, Aquatic Centre, Adelaide Aquatic Centre Future Options Report. And I look for a mover. Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, seconder, Councillor Martin. Deputy Lord Mayor, did you wish to speak to it? Oh, sorry, I think Councillor Martin wasn't seconding. Oh, you weren't seconding. Okay, sorry, members, I look for a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Abraham, today. Deputy Lord Mayor, did you wish to speak to it? Uh, can I just say I'm so proud to be an, uh, as part of the council that is actually progressing the matter of the Aquatic Centre. It has languished uh, for many, many years. Um, it's needed uh, a lot of work done to it in recent years. Um, and it's fast becoming a liability for the council. And looking at the parts of the centre currently which are closed, um, uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's a risk, not not currently to people that use it because those parts have been closed off. But uh, we need a new aquatic centre. We needed a new aquatic centre last year, the year before, and probably ten years ago as well. Um, my understanding uh, from talking to staff is that it was constantly put on the never-never, on the back burner, didn't want to touch it, take the ostrich approach, stick your head in the sand, uh, and the next council will deal with it. Well, that's been done for probably a few councils, and, and this council now cannot go past the need to deal with it. Um, I'm very hopeful uh, that we will uh, be able to see uh, a superior aquatic centre that has a superior offering um, to people inside and outside the city. Um, and that ultimately it will see enough usage um, uh, that uh, it will it will turn a modest profit, and that those profits can then uh, be put aside and put into a, a sinking fund that then can be used for the future maintenance of the centre. That's the dream, um, and that's the dream so that no future council needs to deal with a potential outlay of $50 million in capital expenditure to rebuild an aquatic centre. Um, that's what I'd like to see happen. This is a critical step in achieving that. I, I sincerely hope the team um, can run as many of these uh, different uh, projects concurrently uh, so that we can finalise designs, we can finalise costings, uh, we can then go and advocate uh, to other levels of government uh, for funding as well. Uh, but this is a this is a magnificent, possibly not the first step, but the first really clear step. Um, and I commend all the team um, that were involved in uh, in getting us to this point. And I commend my colleagues as well uh, that have also supported putting the aquatic centre on the agenda so that we get a new facility for our community uh, and for those people adjacent to our community that use the centre as well. Hey, Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Abraham today, do you wish to speak? Uh, just very quickly, Lord Mayor, to echo the Deputy Lord Mayor's uh, remarks and also to thank. Uh, Tom and his team for uh, doing a wonderful job um, as a long-time user of the uh, facilities. It's been a, a, a long time coming uh, and, um, uh, and I'm sure the, the community uh, uh, would feel the same. Thank you. Councillor Martin. 
Um, yes, Lord Mayor, look, I would like to propose uh, an amendment, if I may, or a variation, if the mover would accept it. Um, uh, we're singing from the same hymn sheet. I just want to add some clarity to it. Um, in 1.1, uh, 1 .1, I want to add a 50 metre pool because that's not clear from the, uh, the information, and I know that's overkill, but it does make it clear then. Um, and I wanted to, to propose uh, at 1.3 that we lose uh, the words to locations and just uh, sorry, Councillor Martin. We just we'll just put a 50 metre pool because um, um, yes, it's one, actually one, talking one. about uses as opposed to I, I size. Um, other fitness um, services in 1.1, or you can put it in 1.2. It doesn't make any difference uh, at a regional scale with a one uh, with one 50 metre pool that would do it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and uh, the other one was designed simply to allow the administration to not be restricted by just two locations. Now, maybe that those two locations are the only obvious locations, but we are engaging a consultant. And so therefore, I'm just uh, uh, proposing that we say um, uh, we lose uh, the words two locations uh, with Denise Norton Park, including but not limited to, and at two lose the words the two. Uh, and lose being the and replace them, including but not limited to. Um, it just broadens it out so that if a consultant comes back and says, look, I want to move it 100 metres this way or I prefer to have it there, they're free to do so. That's that's all it does. If, if the sorry. Deputy Lord Mayor is... Sorry, sorry, we're just trying to make sure that we gather that so yeah, sure. assesses two locations including but not limited to two, i think correct. including um, locations sorry locations including but not limited to yeah and then similarly it's just repeating that to so it says two locations including but not limited to Um, I'll look to the mover to see if he is comfortable accepting that. Okay, look. Well, and then this, the meeting, is the meeting happy to accept that as a variation? If then, so it looks like they are. So, Councillor Martin, if you'll Thank you will Thank you. And look, I, uh, I share the Deputy Lord Mayor's enthusiasm. Um, as a North Ward councillor, it is just sensational that we are turning our attention to this facility uh, and that it will continue as a much loved community facility at Park 2. Um, my intention in, in proposing those variations is, as it seems, just simply to give the, um, uh, the consultant the opportunity to look at it as openly as possible, uh, knowing that two, two locations have been nominated, but giving them the freedom to, to say, well, let's move it 50 feet this way or 60 feet that way or whatever, if they so choose. Um, and the length of the pool has been discussed, uh, and though uh, it is uh, inferred, uh, it then becomes implicit by putting those words into the motion. Um, Lord Mayor, I'm hoping that this, uh, this process, this uh, $90,000 investigation, um, will come up with uh, ultimately some plans, um, plans that will carry uh, this facility uh, well into the end of this century. Um, and uh, my greatest hope is that ultimately it will be serviced by a tramway that runs all the way to Park 2. Um, that would be a most sensational outcome, not only for that facility, not only for North Adelaide. Excellent. But if we can stick to the motion before us, that would be great. Oh, uh, thank you, Councillor Martin. Thank you. Um, I have Councillor Cross and Councillor Mackey. 
It's very exciting that we're moving forward, Lord Mayor. Um, I think uh, I echo everything else, that the, everything that the Deputy Lord Mayor said. It's been a long journey to get here, and it's very exciting. And I'd like to thank um, administration for the work that they put into into this. And I'd also like to thank the councillors that um, actually have come on board and and recognise the importance of um, leaving it at um, on Park Two. Um, it is is formulated as such a um, part of North Adelaide on Park, on Park 2 um, and it's um, very, very happy that we're looking at keeping it there. Um, what the end results will be, be we'll, we'll see, but um, I'm glad we're on this journey and I'm really excited and I'd like to thank everyone for all the efforts that they're going to work. Thank you, Councillor Kurz. Councillor Mackey. Uh, thank you, uh, Lord Mayor. Um, Lord Mayor and, and my fellow elected members will of course be aware that I had e expressed uh, a desire that we investigate further the option of a CBD location and I just want to foreshadow I will be supporting this motion um, but I just wanted to uh, um, express uh, the hope that in the undertaking of this feasibility study and I understand from the workshop and the uh, committee uh, briefings uh, that there is a uh, majority disposition toward this motion and I'm, I'm not going to stand in its way uh, but I, I just want to uh, express the hope that uh, the consultant will um, not uh, will engage uh, with the state and commonwealth governments uh, to test their mood and that in bringing a report back that they not be constrained in the event, and I'm not, I have no insider um, sense of this, but in the event that there were, for example, on the part of the Commonwealth to be an appetite for a more substantial uh, vision than a regional uh, a swimming aquatic facility, that that not be uh, excluded from our future consideration. Thank you. Members, I'll just make, make a few quick comments before um, we sum up. Um, Look, I, um, I actually thank Councillor Martin for adding the 150 metre pool because it was something that was discussed and it's it's better to have it there as part of the motion. Um, thank you. Um, I think we have actually had uh, lots of discussion around location, um, but I do understand that there may be other areas within that that we could look at. Um, just in terms of a, a previous councils, of course, the last council uh, was uh, Yarwood's council that spent a sub substantial amount on the pools, which was the re uh, the redoing of the 50 metre pool, which in was a lighthouse project for our access and inclusion panel, which put the ramp in um, and also redid the swim school, the swim school area, which allowed us to increase the swim school numbers and filtration systems. Um, and that was, I think, between six and eight million dollars that was invested um, at that point in time. Um, I, I think we probably should, to be cheeky, maybe thank the Crows for bringing this to not only our attention, but the public's attention in such a way that we are now fully paying attention to our aquatic centre as we should have. And I agree with Deputy Lord Mayor. Oh, sorry. Oh, are you now the Deputy Lord Mayor? <laughs> Oh, from the 1st of December. Yeah. Sorry, Councillor, yeah. Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, that, um, that, you know, I'm really, really pleased that this council has taken on the Aquatic Centre and finally moving towards um, something that will look at a, a new regional facility for us and for the city and all those users. Um, I will go to the Deputy Lord Mayor to sum up. Summed up. Members to the vote, those in favour, those against, that is carried. Um, that us to uh, 10.4. I look for a mover. Councillor Donovan, under seconder. Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor. Thanks, Councillor Mayor. I'd like to um, move a variation which I have sent through. So I'll just briefly outline the three points of variation. If that's all right with you, Lord Mayor? Yes. Yes. So they're all highlighted. Um, the first point under car parking uh, adds in, in alignment with strategy 2.8 of the Adelaide Parklands Management Strategy 2015 to 2025. 
and that strategy is that we reduce car parking on the parklands by 5% in the period to 2025, that no additional car parking is recommended for this CLMP. It also just adds in that little point around the showground parking, simply that we initiate a review of the current contract prior to the contractual end date. So no change except to initiate a review. And then the third point uh, under item four, which is only for noting anyway, but that we note that under 4.1, we just scrub out that word ground. So instead a maximum footprint of 485 square meters um, on up to two levels, etc. So those three changes, no additional car parking in alignment with our strategic intent. Um, initiating a review of the showground parking uh, 12 months prior to the contractual endpoint and a maximum footprint of 465 metres on both levels. If I could just ask for clarification, I'll look for a seconder. When you've removed the word ground and put up to, so you're talking about 465 oh, across. Yeah, so 465 times two, times two. Oh, times two. Yeah, if there's uh, okay. a way of, okay. so on up to two levels. So on up to, yeah, thank yeah. you. Um, I'll look for a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Councillor Donovan, if you'd like to, like to speak to that. Thanks, Lord Mayor. So, um, first of all, I would really like to thank Ray Schubeck and his team because I know he has done an absolutely amazing job in consulting with the community on this CLMP, really listening to the feedback from the community and managing the very difficult task of, on the one hand, considering future usage, considering uptake and increases to recreation and sport usage and on the other hand looking at our existing commitments and our strategic intent around parklands. So I, I genuinely think he's done a sensational job and the whole team. Um, in talking to and reviewing all of the feedback and specifically in regard to the car parking, I think we can achieve the intent without having to build onto the car park, onto the parklands. We are talking about aiming to reduce car parking on the, on the parklands by 5% and over time, of course, we've actually gone up. Um, it is a difficult challenge to balance out, but what we know, and for those who might be less familiar with the area, if you actually look at Google Maps of that section of the parklands and look at the surrounding areas, on South Terrace, immediately opposite, the car, opposite Park 21 West, there's a brand new publicly available car park that previously was for use only by the Master Builders Association and now brand new in the sense that it's now publicly available and now for after hours has 50 car parks that are available for usage. If you look along that section, there's an additional 82 car parks in two other adjacent buildings. And I think we need to look at more innovative methods of supplying car parking. Yes, of course, we know we have people traveling in from surrounds that, that will be accessing car parking, utilizing car parking, but instead of putting it on the, car, on the parklands, let's look at all of those car parks that are sitting there empty after hours and encourage those landholders to be utilising that car parking. And it's already happening in the last 18 months. So since we came into council, that Master Builders Association car park has transitioned. They have recognised the business opportunity of actually making a few dollars from that after hours car parking. And there are now 50 more publicly available car parks directly opposite Park 21 West that are available for public usage. There's an additional 82. We can do the math. That's that's you know 132, and we're talking about 112 in this strategy. So let's look at some innovative methods of, of accessing car parking, supporting those businesses rather than building on the on the, the parklands. So that's the first point of change. The second is just to initiate a review of the existing contract to see whether it's still as we would intend, and I'm sure that that would be the intent anyway, but just to include it in the community land management plan. And the third point, and this is again just for noting, noting that the building will come back to uh, council anyway for review, but just ensuring that that, again, the footprint is clear that we're saying 465 square metres on two levels. Thank you to the chamber. Thank you, Councillor Martin. I reserve my right, Lord Mayor. Councillor Kerrin. Uh, thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, look, I speak against this uh, against this change. Um, I think that uh, I think that uh, in a year when the Royal Show has suffered 
uh, the most uh, profound crisis in its probably its entire existence. Uh, I think sending the messaging that we are to make uh, to reduce the amount of parking uh, to the Royal Show and to make things difficult for the Royal Show in any way whatsoever uh, is completely and utterly the wrong messaging uh, for the City Council to be sending at this juncture. Uh, and I propose that this be revisited uh, at the very least after the Royal Show is allowed to recommence uh, without the impediment uh, of negative publicity around parking and accessibility. That is the last thing the Royal Show needs and the last thing this entire state needs in relation to that vital event. So I speak very strongly to councillors to, to, to uh, reject this amendment. Um, Councillor Donald, can I ask you to turn your microphone off, please? Thank you. Councillor Mackey. Uh, thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, I, I want to thank uh, the administration for the uh, paper and also uh, the briefings that we've enjoyed at committee and um, also to thank Councillor Donovan uh, for the uh, improvements that, you're, um, uh, that, that, you, that you've proposed uh, to the motion. We are and we claim to be one of the world's great cities in a park, not a city in a car park. And while I don't claim authorship of that, um, that phrase, um, it resonate, has resonated with me for many, many years. And I think the additional information that Councillor Donovan has brought to our attention regarding the, uh, the expansion of very close by parking amenity uh, suggests that we can uh, support the improvement of community facilities within our within our parklands, uh, but without creating yet another piece of alienated open lot car parking space on our precious parklands. So, um, I, I thank you for the motion, Councillor Donovan, and um, commend it. Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, did you wish to speak? Yeah, I just have a quick question um, of the administration. Is this the only? Uh, is this the only part of the parklands which is subject to uh, the arrangement whereby U Park runs a car park for the Adel Royal Adelaide Show? Is this the only? Yeah, through the way we believe that's the case. Right, right. And so, so this would be the only CLMP that is relevant to to car parking that that occurs on there. Through you, Lord Mayor. I'm told there's three. So there's three CLMPs that are responsible for managing the overall car parking contract that we have. For that's, the correct. that's correct. Okay. Um, that's correct. That's what I suspected. Um, uh, Lord Mayor, I, I'll just speak to this briefly. Um, and that's, I completely understand the intent here. Um, but I think if we're going to uh, look at the arrangement that occurs with regards to car parking, absolutely, just as Helen has said, um, uh, you know, you look at what's available around the place, you look at what's what's on the parklands roads that are nearby, uh, you look at what the private sector is providing, and you mash it all together and you talk about what demand is and what availability is. By all means, very happy to do that. What I want to, what I don't want to do, and what I'm very hesitant to do, um, uh, is to tinker with one community CLMP um, when actually three are relevant to the contract. Um, and I'd hate to, you know, tinker with one uh, and then throw something out in the others. Um, uh, by all means, I'm happy to consider the matter of parking on the parklands and whether there are better ways to do it um, uh, to, to preserve, uh, you know, to preserve the parklands as they are and should be, which is green, open public space. Um, however, I have misgivings about only tinkering with one of the CLMPs when there are three that we need to look at. Um, uh, I'd be happy to consider something brought at a later date that sort of cracks open that nut. And you know, if we sit down and we say we want to look at we want to look at this because we don't think it's good enough, that's that's fair enough. I'm very happy to consider that. But I think this is a, an ad hoc way to approach it, um, and I would far. Uh, prefer that if we need to bring three CLMPs in to talk about it, we'll bring three in and look at what demand and availability um, there is of car parks. So that's why that's why I couldn't support this. Um, it's just because of the ad hoc nature of it. I understand the intent, and I think um, absolutely the five percent reduction and and I know we're throwing this around at Apple Lord Mayor. You know potentially that needs to be more than a five percent reduction, um, even just to make the point that we're not meeting that target as it is. Um, so very happy to discuss those things. I just don't think this is the correct way um, uh, to go about it. Members? So, sorry, Councillor Martin. I had my hand up, Lord Mayor. I thought you saw it. Uh, 
No, I didn't, but there you go. Sorry, Councillor Donovan's hand went up as well. So, Councillor Martin, I'll go to you well, first, um, and then Councillor Donovan. So. Okay, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, can I ask the administration if there are three CLMPs involved, uh, what would be the process for recalling each and every one of those at one point in time to assess the showgrounds parking arrangements? How would that be done? CEO. Thanks, Claire. Uh, thank you, through the presiding member. We'd recommend addressing it through the Adelaide Parklands Management Strategy as the overarching strategic document that guides the um, longer term use of each of our parks. And then based on that, we would then drill down into CLMP reviews for specific parks. And we can prioritise that, obviously, in conjunction with that plan council. So if the Royal Showgrounds in particular became the most burning um, desire for council to address in the first instance, then following endorsement of a revised park plans management strategy, we would then prioritise the three CLMPs to address that specific issue. And the park lands management strategy is 2015 to 25. I'm assuming then it would be the next council that would be considering that. Is that correct? Uh, my understanding is it's uh, the reviews to commence within the next two years, so it would be this council. Oh, what, during caretaker? Why would, it, why would we do that during caretaker, councillor? Oh, okay. you just said the next two years. Mm -hmm. Two yeah. years, uh, it'll be almost election day. No, we've actually within. started. Start within. We've actually started the review. We have to complete the review within the next two years. Oh, I see. So we finished the review in 2022 for the 2025. We may finish it next year. We have just started that process. Oh, OK. I wasn't aware of that, Lord Mayor. OK. Um, look, I uh, look. I agree with um, uh, Councillor Donovan. I, I do think that there is a need to start addressing this issue. And the proposal, uh, contrary to what uh, Councillor Kira was saying, is that the matter should be visited in 2024, that is in four years from now, not next year, not the year after, whatever, that is one year before the agreement expires. And it's not suggesting that it's cancelled, uh, it's suggesting that there's a discussion with the show society. And I think that's prudent because um, it, it, uh, it, at the moment, the show society is uh, under the impression that these parking arrangements uh, could continue forever. Why wouldn't they be under any other impression? Uh, because the city has CLMPs, including one which it's revisited and which it is making no comment on and which will remain in force for some considerable number of years. Um, so I, I think that what Councillor Donovan says is sensible. We are simply flagging to the show society there needs to be a discussion. Uh, but I do sense the uh, the mood of uh, uh, the opposition in the room to that. Uh, and Councillor uh, Martin, thank you. No, no, I'm, no, I'm no, not no, no. If you can actually please speak to the motion, thank you, rather than the mood in the room. Well, okay. I would really appreciate it. I, I understand that. I'd appreciate it if you wouldn't interrupt when I'm acknowledging the opposition. Councillor Martin, it's not about acknowledging the opposition. We are talking to the motion before us. Thank you. Well, Lord Mayor, I'm just flabbergasted. I really am. But look, I'll move on. I'll move on. I'll go to the next point. Uh, and that is that the uh, uh, the parking arrangements on the parklands are uh, completely at odds with our policy. Our policy uh, recommends a reduction in parking, not an addition. And it says specifically no additional car parking. Uh, and therefore I would recommend uh, to members that they do support that, uh, not least because this car park particularly is one that will be entirely visible to motorists travelling along Edward Cohen Drive. Uh, you can see from the illustrations, uh, the, the view will be not of the facility, but of the car park. Um, in fact, you won't even see the green, you'll see cars parked there if we endorse this. Um, and, and Lord Mayor, uh, I might ask, and, and perhaps Councillor Donovan will too, uh, recognising, uh, no, I'm sorry, I can't even recognise it. Uh, can I suggest that we take the matter in parts? Uh, and perhaps Councillor Donovan might suggest that also. 
Councillor Donovan, if it's a question, I can take it. If that I'm... was going to be my question to you earlier, Lord Mayor, okay. if we can take it, given it's three separate issues, essentially, can yep. we just break it into those three separate? Certainly. Uh, members, any other speakers? If not, I'll go to Councillor Donovan to sum up. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, just to reassure those who were concerned about the showgrounds parking issue, I hear the concern and just to reiterate, it's, it is a review. It's not saying remove it. It's saying let's look at this issue. Let's look at the pros and cons. Let's look at the balance of issues. Um, you know, we do know that that showground parking generates some income. Yes, it's convenient to the showgrounds. Yes, but on the flip side, it means that those sporting and recreational uh, activities that typically take place cease for that entire time. It's a couple of weeks, so it's simply something to review. It's not it's not a suggestion that it should be terminated or otherwise, simply to prompt the review. Um, but Lord Mayor, if you're happy to take it in parts, it seems as though that's the main point of contention. Um, so we can go through each of the other points and as is, uh, is highlighted in that first point, um, we would be adhering to the existing parklands strategy uh, by looking to not add additional car parking when in actual fact our strategy is talking about reducing car parking to 2025 which of course we are not currently in alignment with so if we take it in parts hopefully we can at least get those other two components moved through thanks for me okay members i will take this in parts so uh, i will look to do parts one three and five if we can go to the vote one three and five no changes to those those in favor those against that is carried um, i will go to part two uh, members those in favor so lord mayor just to clarify there are two parts to part I two i can't split two parts to part two can i then change two. it to make it to make it two i and two one and or two a and two b to clarify those two points so that we can discuss those two things separately Okay, a split of a split, members. So we'll go to uh, part 2A, those in favour, those against. What's that type? Um, I'll vote in favour. And 2B, uh, those in favour, those against. And that is lost. Um, then we go to my apologies, members. Can I have two two B? Uh, those in favour. So that's carried. And uh, then we go to part four. Uh, members, those in favour. Those against, that's carried. Thanks, members. We now go to um, 10.7, which is investigation of subsidy program for retail hospitality businesses. Um, I will look for a mover. Thank you, Councillor Kouros. And a seconder. Uh, Councillor Kouros, you want to put forward your alternate motion? Yes. And Deputy Lord Mayor is seconding that. Councillor Kouros, would you like to speak to your alternate? Would you like me to read it out? Or uh, no, I think members, if members can see the screen, uh, you're welcome to speak to it. Yeah, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, acknowledging that the cost of this program is um, very costly and uh, but acknowledging also that the technology on this is also very good. Um, so what I'm asking uh, as an amendment is uh, to have this um, investigated or have this request this to go to the Adelaide Economic Development Agency, which we will hope to have operating uh, next year, um, and uh, investigate options for uh, costings to develop a digital marketing place to promote city businesses and using an information technology application to promote the services um, and their own discounts similar to the My Darwin technology and the intent. Um, also, to, uh, this technology can also extend for the City of Adelaide to advertise events and festivals that are happening in the city. So basically, um, if we can take, if the Adelaide um, uh, Economic Development Agency can look at this um, 
technology that is under the My Darwin to be able to take the licensing agreements if that's what's required or change the technology on it for it to be a directory service, an app a service for the businesses in, in the city to be able to register and to be able to pro promote their own discounts and, and whatever they, and their services. And also, it could also be a service for us as a council to um, advertise the events that we have. So I'm just basically asking um, for councillors to um, have this directed towards the Adelaide Economic Development Agency. Councillor Kouros, Deputy Lord Mayor, did you wish to speak? Councillor Abraham today, did you wish to speak? No. no. Members? Councillor Martin? Oh, just a question of the administration. Its recommendation is um, that it's not a cost effective option. Um, could you remind me why it's not cost effective so that I can make an assessment of whether it's going to be cost effective to give it to someone else? CEO? Thanks. Thanks, Ian. Could you respond? Uh, yeah, just. Sorry, Councillor Cross, could I ask you to just turn your microphone off? Councillor Cross, thank you. Um, through the chair, as we discussed in committee last week, uh, I think it was about 61% of people uh, respond around the My Darwin application, which indicated they, they were just going to spend that money in the city regardless. So there wasn't necessarily an economic uplift by using um, that particular mechanism, which was essentially cash into the cash straight into the system for the consumer to use. My understanding of this amendment is a broader digital marketplace for all city businesses across the CBD. Um, and one of the models that exists right now is the Australian Tourism Data Warehouse, which works extremely well in the tourism sector, um, which does connect businesses to consumers. And so if a council approves this, it's then up to the agency when eventually it's formed to make a judgment about whether or not it's got economic benefit. Is that correct? Uh, Greg, that's how I understand it. Okay. Um, Lord Mayor, uh, just uh, one quick thing. There's a grammatical in there. The word to before events is uh, surplus. Oh, to advertise events. Thank you. Uh, have Councillor Kerr. Oh, uh, I was just going to speak in favour of this amendment. Um, I think it's already been clarified, but let, let's be clear. Uh, this says that the uh, uh, um, development agency investigates uh, this does not mandate uh, any spending uh, on, on, on any um, outcome, uh, but it is a very good thing to put to the uh, ADDA. I think it would give comfort to the councillors that such a thing has been investigated. It is a good initiative to look at. It's fundamentally different as well because there are, I don't see that there's any subsidy uh, in this uh, amendment or proposal, uh, which was, I think, the nub of the concerns of the administration. Uh, I wholeheartedly support this uh, amendment. I think it's an excellent thing for the council to put uh, right on the agenda, right at the outset of the new body. Thank you. Uh, members, if not, back to Councillor Kouros to sum up. Someday. Members to the vote, those in favour? Those against, that is carried. Uh, members, that takes us to uh, 10.8. Look from the Deputy Lord Mayor. Thanks, Lord Mayor. I have an alternative that was sent through. Um, did members need me to read that out or so, just briefly? Yes, yeah, yeah, so, uh, I think it's been circulated, hasn't it? No, no? I can see it. Oh, if I just wait for a moment for members to actually have a read. Lord Mayor, it would be helpful if someone could tell us how different it is to the... Yeah. Motion. That, that would help. What are the differences? I, I, I'm happy to flag the two major differences. Yep. Um, uh, everything's approved as it was and as it appeared. Um, but with the following amendments, which is one, two, three, well, one, 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 two, one, three, one, four, one, five, uh, which are changes to existing eligibility uh, criteria. And then uh, two, noting that at 1.2, it uh, increases it from 10,000 to 20,000. Um, two then notes the maximum cost of 4.3 million, etc., etc., um, based on the information that was circulated earlier today in response to my queries at the committee. Members, I will look for a seconder and I will also ask members, uh, I'll just get some advice around conflicts of interest. Thank you, Rudy. 
through the Lord Mayor. Um, so for those members who may fit the criteria listed in 125 there, um, those members will have to turn their mind to potential conflicts of interest as it may relate to their uh, particular specific business uh, involvements. Councillor Knoll. I'll, I'll need to vacate the room. I have an actual conflict of interest because I have a couple of properties that are within uh, the city council. Thank you, Councillor Knoll. Can I ask a clarification on this from administration in relation to conflict of interest? Um, does the rule not uh, allow for uh, a conflict not to be, well, for a member not to have to vacate and to continue to vote where there are a large number of potential as a cohort uh, who may benefit from this, from the proposal? See you. Yeah, read really the substantial past clause. Uh, through the Lord Mayor, whilst there is an exemption available when you share the benefit or loss with a substantial proportion of rate pays in the city, here uh, are, and ultimately it's of course each individual member's judgment call, um, I would be cautious here because uh, it is a rather narrow description here. Um, for example, the tenants of the City of Adelaide, it's uh, probably not right to say or justifiable that you share that with a substantial proportion of rate payers in the city. Um, so members may want to turn their mind to the conflict of interest provisions. It is of course your judgment call here. Um, and you have various options available when this is an actual conflict of interest. The reason why it's actual and not material is because it is still subject to you ultimately applying for that and being successful in it. Therefore, it's not material, but actual, in my view, uh, you then need to act uh, in, uh, accordingly by uh, removing that conflict in an accountable way, which may be that you, for example, decide to participate in the debate but not vote, or you may want to decide to not participate and not vote and, and vacate the room. That's Thank a judgment. You. Thank you, Rudy. Just a follow-up question for May, Lord Mayor. Uh, do you think that a conflict of interest uh, in this matter, uh, to the extent that a member should vacate, do you, do you believe that would be obviated uh, if the member uh, did not apply for any benefit under the scheme in subsequent term? Uh... CEO. Yeah, thanks, Rudy. Um, through the Lord Mayor, the recommendation as it's worded in front of you, of course, doesn't include an exclusion for particular members to, to ultimately apply for this. So, um, you know, um, the optics of that uh, are not quite right in my view, because if you have the motion worded as is, without excluding council members potentially applying for it, then it, the, the public can't just assume that that's what you will or will not do. May I uh, suggest a variation to the mover uh, to uh, to to allow uh, efficacy to allow efficacy of this motion to be properly considered? Are you the chair, Phil? May, may I suggest? Uh, um, a actually, the mover hasn't moved it yet. Okay. We've actually just put up the uh, alternate motion, so it has not been moved as yet. We so. So can I can I can I just ask for, for clarity based on through you, Lord Mayor, what? Um, what our manager of governance has said. Uh, so, for example, you have to consider each specific uh, uh, category there. So, tenants of the city of Adelaide would be eligible. So, that is a pool of uh, a mere what two or three hundred potential people that you're singling out. Um, uh, but, for example, the business is currently open and operating. And let's say, for example, that that's the vast majority of the four thousand. So then. Well, if it's the vast majority of the 4,000 which is relevant to you, then you're actually sharing it with a substantial portion of ratepayers. But if it's 300, it's a lot less. Is that was that the logic? CEO, in terms of yeah, CEO. Thanks, Rudy. Let Rudy answer that. Um, through the chair, in addition, um, it's unclear to me whether all these one to five are to be read as either or or and in addition as criteria in addition um, assuming that they are standalone ones uh, it's fair to say that the business is currently open and operating you will share that as a business operator with a substantial substantial class or proportion of rate pays in the city um, but that can't be said for, for for example uh, number five tenants of the city of adelaide will be eligible uh, because that's a way narrower class so, final question, final question. Oh, sorry um, would, would your advice change uh, if the motion was amended 
uh, to include the terms on an application basis uh, at some point in the uh, in, in the motion. My understanding of Rudy's already answered that question because you can't exclude an application in the future. Oh. So you're you're so, and it's up to each individual member to decide whether they believe they have an actual conflict. Councillor Kouros. In that case, I have an actual conflict. We have four businesses in the city, so. And you can decide whether to stay for the debate or to leave the chamber. Um, and vote or not vote. Well, I won't be voting, um, and I will leave the chamber. Thank you. Councillor Ho. Well, let's see. I have an actual confidence of interest as I have a business in the city and I'm not going to be voting. I will be okay. To the Thank you, Councillor Ho. Councillor Kerra. Uh, I'm, I'm on the borderline, but for uh, the benefit of the doubt, I'm going to uh, stay in actual conflict as well. Leave and not be voting. Sorry, the, uh, it would, um, Councillor Mackey, would you mind turning Councillor Kouros's microphone off? Councillor Donovan? Likewise, Lord Mayor, for just to complete clarity, I have an actual conflict of interest as the key employee decision maker of okay. a business within the City of Adelaide. Okay. Members, at that point we lose quorum, which means that a decision can't be made on this motion, on the amended motion. No, I, sorry, Lord Mayor, I understood that quorum uh, will be maintained if people have conflicted themselves out. I will ask advice on that, Counts, uh, Deputy Lord Mayor. Uh, actually, Governance says only if they remain. I will just wait for some advice, just a moment, and I will get advice on that. Through the chair, uh, pursuant, to, pursuant to section 75A, uh, actual and perceived conflicts of interest, if a quorum at a meeting cannot be formed because a member of council proposes to exclude himself from the meeting in order to comply, then the member will not be taken to have contravened the subsection by participating, including by voting in the meeting in, rel in relation to that matter. Um, so um, if those members who have declared their conflict and decided to deal with the conflict by removing themselves from the, the chamber were to decide to come back to support the quorum, then they can and they're basically absolved from, from that. That makes sense. But they still don't have to vote. So they can be present but not vote. Um, including voting, so they can oh, vote. Oh, they have to vote. Yep. Okay, so that means that they're saying they don't have a conflict. So that's great for me to hear that, but we probably should tell that to the people outside. No, that basically means that they can come back in, but then they have to vote, which means that they're basically saying that they are voting against their conflict of interest. But, but, they're, but they're exempt from being in breach of having a conflict. That's what the legislation says. So we should probably communicate that advice to them because they're not here. I will just might take a moment there. Yeah. Councillor Martin. Um, yeah, yeah Lord, Lord Mayor, um, I, I am sympathetic to this proposal and I, I'm anxious to vote on it. Can I just propose that the matter is adjourned? It's not that time sensitive uh, and it can come back in a form that will allow the participation of members confused as to what form that would even be at this well, point. But well, I'm okay. talking about I might just that. suspend the debate for the moment and so that because we don't have a quorum, so we actually are out of quorum at the moment, so I'm just going to suspend discussion until we get some clear advice. Thank you. 
So the advice is that they're, under the Act, if the quorum's at risk, they can decide to come back in to form quorum, but then they actually have to vote, which means that the conflict of interest is noted, but they're still voting against the conflict of interest. So Rudy's going to speak to members, and then we'll see where we go from there. Deputy Lord Mayor, did you want to seek a deferral to December meeting? Um, I'm just trying to play out in my mind procedurally how that would work, because if you deferred this as it was, it would just come back and need yeah. to be amended again. So uh, We would have Councillor Moran here. I, I'd be far more interested in a solution which uh, avoids this, whatever this is just, occurring. It, yeah, just, that's, that's the, fine. I'm just asking whether you prefer to defer so that you can work a little bit more on the uh, alternate motion and to so that we can work out what the liability is and what the conflicts of interest are ahead of time. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to. I mean, what does that do to the existing recommendations, which was only for noting? But... The existing recommendation is for noting, so we can go back to the existing, which is then we note everything and then we can bring well, the motion in, to, in December. I'm happy to uh, withdraw this, this alternative. Okay, thank we'll you. Go back, we can go back to noting. And then we can have a look at how we can uh, work through the conflict of interest for December. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I do just have a subsequent alternative. There's okay. just one thing I want to remove from the... The All right. Well, let's get everybody back in but the room and then we will withdraw this and make the amendment, uh, the variation to the motion. So members, we're going to, uh, the Deputy Lord Mayor is going to withdraw his uh, alternate motion. We're going back to the original motion and he has a variation on the uh, motion. It's uh, largely the same. I just wish to remove one. And no, 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 I mean, of, no. of, the, of the other one. So delete original. part one. Delete one, because that's not true. Sorry, guys. Sorry, but it's not true. That's not true. That's a fact. I mean, if you want to remove it, that's Robert, fine. we can debate during the debate if you want. But okay, members, at the, moment. at the moment, we are just working through a variation. So you want to delete part one and uh, any other changes? And part six. And part six. Yeah, because this isn't primary school. Everything has a material impact. Okay, uh, I'm looking for a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Abraham. Today, Councillor uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, did you wish to speak to that? Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. I'll speak to this briefly. It's not the speech I prepared. It's quite different. Um, not that I prepare speeches, but uh, look, this uh, removes part one um, because there was take substantial issue with the figures that are in part one. Um, to date, the City of Adelaide has really only given of its own money not even its own money, there are it's the money of other people, but it's only really provided from its own revenue uh, around, around a couple of million dollars to support our businesses. The, the measures that were purported to have been there to support business largely consisted of foregone revenue. Uh, uh, they consisted of policies which existed pre-COVID. They consisted of um, uh, state government monies that were provided to the City of Adelaide to administer um, they consisted of uh, legislative requirements, which I've already said, but um, also policies that were in place pre-COVID uh, should not be counted as support during this COVID time. Those were the parameters and support for business that we were wishing to put in place before. To try and palm it off um, as something that we've done now, I think is disingenuous in the extreme. It's disingenuous because there are businesses closing their doors now. There are people doing it tough now. Um, and for this council to sit back and say, oh, well, this capital city's given X amount and this capital city's given Y amount, 
but we're not even going to come close to giving on a per capita basis the same. Um, I think really, really concerns me because it actually goes to the culture of this organisation, Lord Mayor. The culture is one that uh, it's considered the City of Adelaide's money. Well, it's actually not the City of Adelaide's money. The City of Adelaide takes the money by levying uh, a fee or levying taxes against the people that constitute the city. Um, uh, and to think it's our money and what could we do with that, uh, I think is the wrong principled starting point to come from. Um, what concerns me most, though, Lord Mayor, is that we hear these ideas around, oh, but what could you do with $3 million? Um, uh, bearing in mind that that is, of course, the maximum cost of the scheme. It's not actually uh, anything close to what, or it may not be anything close to what is actually expended on the scheme. That's just the maximum cost. That's the line in the spreadsheet that says everyone below $10,000. Um, in rates, uh, we add all of that up. The same with the uh, the larger figure that we saw earlier, the information that was circulated earlier. Everyone who pays uh, $20,000 or less added up in the city of Adelaide. Well, actually, if you compare that, compare that, so you've got 4,416 small businesses. Let's bump it up a little bit because that was the 2016 census. Let's say it's 4,500, 4,600 businesses. Um, uh, if you look at the information that was circulated uh, earlier today, which I think that's it, my memory. Um, you're looking at, you're looking at, uh, if you're looking at people that's annual rate range is below twenty thousand dollars, you're looking at eight thousand one hundred and sixty-four. So really, that's the number of non-residential assessments. So that line in the sand that you've drawn, based on the number of small businesses that may be eligible, if I could just have a minute more, Lord Mayor. Um, that line in the sand is actually going to be substantially less. So, to, so to, to, to think that it's actually going to cost that much is wrong um, because only 44, 4,600 people are going to be eligible out of the non residential assessments of, assessments of 8,000. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Um, uh, so, we really need to bear in mind what we've actually done today, which has shamefully, very shamefully, been incredibly little to support our non-residential, our business ratepayers here in the city of Adelaide. Uh, compare that to what the actual cost would be. I mean, heck, Lord Mayor, uh, I've taken, after recent events, I measure things now uh, in how many pigeons in Rumble Mall we could buy. And the calculations, my very rough calculations, is that the measure that was proposed before, if we, if we drew that line at $20,000, the maximum cost uh, would be in the region of 28 pigeons to help our ratepayers to provide some stimulus for businesses, it would cost us 28 pitches. So let's just keep that into perspective when we're throwing money around, um, uh, when, we're, when we're talking about massive capital expenditure on all the place, uh, artwork included. We need to keep it into perspective. Um, and I look forward to discussing this in the future. Thank you. Councillor Abraham. Is that all right? Members, I have Councillor Sims and Councillor Kira. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, look, I, I wasn't going to talk on this, but um, the outgoing Deputy Lord Mayor has um, encouraged me to do so because it isn't factually correct to say that Council um, has provided uh, no support to business. Um, there has been a lot of support provided. I would argue if there is a cohort um, of the uh, um, Resident, uh, if there is a, a cohort of the council base that's been overlooked, it is residents. Um, and you know, I've argued previously for those who lost their jobs during COVID-19 to have been given um, a uh, an exemption for a quarter that would have cost about two hundred thousand um, dollars. That was not supported, but it's simply not true to say we haven't done um, anything at all. Um, and the attack on um, public art seems to me to be a rather bizarre comment to make. Um, so, you know, I hope we can move on from this. Councillor Kerrin. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, I'd just like to second uh, the passionate and I think very timely speech by the Deputy Lord Mayor on this matter. I think it is a time to, uh, to pause and reflect and not just uh, wave through uh, this, re this report and this recommendation. Um, I think that the, uh, the test uh, let's face it, the test when it comes to government and taxpayers' money, the test, Lord Mayor, uh, should be uh, that, first of all, people spend their own money uh, better than government does. People spend their own money better than government does. That should be the base point on evaluating uh, taxation. The exception, of course, is where people delegate, genuinely delegate to government to spend money on their behalf. Um, 
if we cannot reflect at this time, and if we do have uh, an administration comment that does not uh, point out the benefits, the positive side of this, then I think it is actually quite warranted that the Deputy Lord Mayor uh, is, is heavily critical. It really is, and we really need to reflect right now. If after this year, uh, we cannot see the benefits after this unbelievably calamitous year, the, the results of which are yet to fully play out, if we cannot see the benefits, of uh, doing something that we know businesses will be grateful for, uh, then I think we have a serious problem of being detached uh, from the public outlook and we have a serious problem about our legitimacy uh, in, in government. Um, so uh, this, uh, to, to, to sum up Lord Mayor, what the Deputy Lord Mayor has said is correct, it is extremely timely, and I would humbly suggest that we all reflect on, on the fact that we must start seeing things from the perspective of our ratepayers now more than ever before. Councillor Kouros. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I can certainly feel the passion from the Deputy Lord Mayor and Councillor Kira, and I echo everything that they have said. Um, but I just want people to just look at it in another perspective. and. 80% of our rates, approximately 80% of our rates, come from businesses, come from a commercial enterprise. This is, uh, we need to protect this as part of our rate revenue. And we need to tell people that we are listening to you. We are listening to what's happening out there. And I, I can see where the Deputy Lord Mayor was going with his amendment and reaching out to them and telling them that we are here for you and standing by you. If there are other measures that we can, or other things that we can put in place to act about our city, to bring people into our city and to show people that you can come and bring your business and open up a business in the city. Because we want other businesses to open. We've got a lot of unleased properties in the city and we want to encourage people to come here and in the city and open up a business. It's so important and that's the messaging that we want to give to people out there is that the Adelaide City Council supports you. The Adelaide City Council is here for you and will support all the businesses out there. And if if there are other measures in which we could do that, great. I'm happy to look at them. But you know, at the present moment, we need to give something back and some encouragement that we are here for them. Members, noting that we are noting this report as the amendment uh, has actually been withdrawn so that we can have a look at it in December. Councillor Martin, you're talking to the noting of the report and the removal of oh, yes. parts one and five. Yes, Lord Mayor, I, I uh, am speaking uh, to the report. Um, I, um, I disagree entirely uh, with the notion that we have assisted businesses and I'm just delighted to hear the enthusiasm in the room for rate relief um, that wasn't there three months ago when I proposed it. Different bill. Um, I proposed something that was much more inclusive. Councillor, right. Councillor Kerr, please. Uh, I proposed something much more inclusive, uh, and that is uh, my uh, problem. Point of, point, of, point of order, Lord Mayor. Uh, there was an imputation uh, about something that's profoundly different being made by Councillor uh, Martin. I believe that ought to be addressed. Okay, it was, uh, there was the, the equivalence that's, is not the same. That's a, not a point of order, it's a point of clarity. But well, it's a, it's a Martin, point of embarrassment, Lord Mayor. It's a point of embarrassment for Councillor Kira who voted against it. Councillor Martin, we are talking to yes, we are, the Lord motion Mayor. in front of us, which is for noting. Yes, and I am the noting removal this, of Lord one Mayor. and five. I am noting this uh, very clearly that there is much enthusiasm for uh, uh, rate relief, not for what is proposed here at this meeting. Uh, this here denies support to business, it denies support to ratepayers, uh, and we need a proposal that can provide assistance to small business. Um, small business has suffered big time, and, and I regret very much that we didn't do something three or four months ago, Lord Mayor, but I, I'm not going to stray from the path of the conversation. Um, I, I do believe, however, Lord Mayor, that an equitable approach to this is necessary. And I'm hoping that uh, in endorsing this, uh, there will be a proposal that comes back to council that is much more equitable. Uh, I recognize it is not always possible to please everyone. And in fact, small business uh, assisted uh, will probably be outnumbered by small businesses who believe they haven't been assisted. Uh, it'll be outnumbered by residents who feel that they've also been neglected, but that shouldn't paralyze you. Lord Mayor, if I could just conclude by um, uh, just getting some clarification and, and bearing in mind that 
um, I propose something that would cost significantly more. Um, if uh, this uh, proposal had been adopted, um, that Actually, is Councillor Martin, we're not talking about something that has been adopted. We're talking about the motion in front of us, which is noting the reports. Well, so I'm we're saying, not talking I'm about anything you, that has Mayor. been adopted or not. We're actually looking at the report in front of us. Well, Lord Mayor, I'm looking at it. You're not listening. Uh, two says, notes the approximate cost of 3.77 million associated with the cash reimbursement initiative that would apply to approximately 4,416 small and medium yes, businesses. Yes, I can read. Thank you, sir. Well, Lord Mayor, you interrupted me to say I wasn't addressing it. I'm addressing it, now you're interrupting me. Uh, I, do, I do hope that you'll let me finish a sentence. And the question I have for the administration is, does that flow immediately to our budget deficit for the year, that cost, uh, and in turn our borrowings, or is there some proposal in which uh, that's addressed? CEO, and um, mindful that all of these questions could be asked in committee, and that is what committee is for, and that is when we have all staff members on hand to answer these questions, I will ask the CEO what he would like to Lord answer. Lord Mayor, I know you hate questions, but look, it's a fact. Councillor Martin, I'm asking the CEO. Through you, Lord Mayor, we intend to workshop with you on the 24th. Um, our budget position and our forward strategy. So um, the, the current situation regarding our deficit and our future borrowings will be addressed through that process. But it is fair to say that anything that Council decides to do by way of spending outside of the current budget would result in an increased deficit. That will result in increased borrowings. Sorry, go straight through. That's, uh, my question's been answered. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry it took so long to get there. Um, just a, a, a looking at overall the intent here of, of trying to support business and uh, I mean the difficulty I have with, with such a simple rate cuts and, and you know and, and talking about that explicitly is that it, it doesn't uh, deliver what business actually needs and that what they need is uh, people in the city they need activations they need that so the issue here is not about uh, providing a, a some sort of uh, costing and it's going to be three million um, that's not the issue the issue is the value for the businesses going forward so in our further conversations about this, it would be fabulous to be able to talk about things where we can bring people in, uh, we find ways that they connect with the businesses that are here, I mean even to the point where you're asking governments etc to, to encourage people to come back in the city. I note that tonight uh, you know, the state uh, parliament is putting through their budget and, and all of their initiatives, so there is lots of initiatives for business coming through. We need to uh, bring them back and uh, you know a three to to thirteen sort of dollar uh, return, or if it's a, a little bit different after per week, is not what is going to assist business. So, then if we have that conversation uh, in December, can we have a conversation about what things we can do that will really bring people back to the city? Because you're going to get a lot more dollar return for that which you're expending, and then we can really uh, engage those that are really going to be able to need it, and also start to uh, bring the people into the city and reconnect them. With us. Okay. That's a fundamental problem that we have. Members, if not, back to the move to sum up, Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, yeah, in, in just in just summing up, Lord Mayor, I just like to highlight um, the uh, the the substantial amount of time that it's taken to get to this point. Um, uh, this is not the first iteration of this scheme which has been discussed in this chamber. In fact, the first was brought by Council Martin on June the 9th um, this year. This has been a long time coming and the fact that one of Council Martin's motions was supported should have been signal enough um, that this was actually the will of this council chamber to deliver something of akin you know, to a scheme like this, some form of relief, um, particularly for our business ratepayers. And, um, when the motion that the motion that brought on this framework, the way it was drafted and everything and what have you, um, actually originally had a timeline in it, uh, and the, the the original reporting timeline, based on the simplicity of the scheme, um, uh, was seeking to have it come back to us in a special meeting uh, within two weeks, two to three weeks, I think, from memory. It was by the end of that month, um, and I removed that as a requirement for this for this little project. Um, uh, out of deference to the administration and to be quite frank out of trust trust that it would still be delivered in a timely manner 
um, the original motion still maintained in it reference to a special council meeting, um, and I cleared it with governance, and that, that reference to a special council meeting meant uh, that we could have a special, a special council meeting at any time to discuss that material. Um, uh, sadly, uh, we're here uh, four months later, four months later than it should have been, uh, discussing the same thing that we were discussing two months before that, um, which is providing some substantial relief uh, to those people who make all of this possible who make the whole city possible. It's about keeping them going. Um, uh, and I'm just, I just wanna say uh, that I'm incredibly disappointed um, that yet again tonight, we will be putting this off. Um, uh, and I just wanna say that my trust um, in the ability uh, of, of, uh, of some of our administration to deliver things in a timely manner, and as well with the, with the best interests of our ratepayers at heart, and also in line with the intent of, of previous motions and to interpret councils, the council's intent is being seriously eroded. Um, it's very disappointing that yet again we'll walk out of here at a ridiculous hour having achieved very little for those people who support us and those people who keep the city going. Members to the vote, those in favour? Those against? Councillor Knoll? Uh, that is carried. Uh, that takes us to uh, 10.9, uh, 10 quarterly forward procurement, no, yes, quarterly forward procurement report. Look for a mover. Thank you, Councillor Abraham today and a seconder. Councillor Martin. Councillor Abraham today. Councillor Martin. Oh, just a quick question. Um, another question, Lord Mayor, I know you don't like them, uh, for the administration. Um, I asked at committee um, if this was uh, going to affect our day-to-day -day banking arrangements and was told uh, that this contract could be influenced by the vote of council when we consider a divestment motion to be put later in relation to fossil fuels. Can the administration clarify, if we vote for this motion now, can it be influenced by the later decision or will the administration say that the previous decision stands? CEO. Yeah, through you, Lord Mayor. We haven't gone to market yet, so it will be able to. Thank you. Members, if not, back to Councillor Abraham today to sum up. Members to the vote, those in favour, those against, that's carried. <coughs> uh, members, that takes us to 10.12, which is the cultural strategy refresh. Look for a mover, Deputy Lord Mayor. Uh, I haven't returned any Lord Mayor. Uh, there is an alternative motion before you, members. Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor is moving the motion. I'm looking for a seconder. Councillor Kerr. Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, Look, some of the feedback that uh, has been received from the public uh, is not actually what's on the pigeon itself. It's not actually what's prompted this. Um, the problem is uh, there is clearly a community expectation that council, as in councillors, uh, were responsible for the approval of that funding. Um, uh, and, and, and in actual fact, we weren't. I wasn't privy to it. Um, uh, Councillor Mackey, Councillor Kouros wasn't privy to it. Other councils in this chamber had no idea that it was going on. Now, uh, look, again, what's, what's prompted this is not the fact that, that there is this wonderful majestic pigeon there in Rundle Mall, which the artwork, I think, you know, is by and large uh, uh, good. But the problem is, and I would be happy to defend its installation had I been made aware of it. Um, I was not made aware of it. Other elected members were not made aware of it. Um, uh, and I think people expect us to be across when something like $200,000 is spent um, on an individual project. Um, the fact that we are not across it, I think is a very, very clear failure um, uh, of the policies and procedures we have placed. Now, don't get me wrong. I do not think there should be undue influence over the process which got you up to the point where you thought, okay, we've got this pigeon, um, uh, it, we think it looks good, it's a little bit provocative, which is what we want, we get people talking um, uh, and what have you. I don't think councillors should be unduly involved in that process, 
Um, very much that should remain with the Public Art Roundtable, the Public Art Reference Group. Uh, and I suppose when you're discussing uh, sort of infrastructure wise, you're looking at the Project Control Group. Um, uh, but, but I do think we still need to be accountable to the people. Um, that's what we're here for. I don't know who ticked off on the 174. I don't know where that delegation sat. It may have sat with the CEO. It may have sat with the relevant director or associate director. I've got no idea. And so when I've got people contacting me, who I haven't spoken to in years, Lord Mayor, saying, why on earth did you do this? I have no answer for them. I have no answer for them. Uh, and that, I believe, is a failure of policy. I think it's a failure of policy that we can rectify here. Um, uh, I think uh, at three, it makes it very clear that we, the council chamber, do not want to be directly involved in, in the creative process, um, uh, but we at least need to be aware and responsible when it comes to the execution of substantial public funds. Uh, and so I'll just leave it there, Lumi. Councillor Kerr. I'll reserve my right. Members, Councillor Sims and then Councillor Kurus. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Look, um, I'm very disappointed by uh, this motion. I think in a democracy, it's very important that actually you have the artistic community sitting at arm's length from politicians. It's not appropriate for um, politicians to say what art should get the green light or you know what art should be rolled out um, in a city such as ours. And Councillor Hyde says um, that it's just coming to council for noting, but it would come to council for approval. That means that this council could determine whether a project should go ahead or whether it should be sent back to the drawing board. And I don't think that's a, a good idea. So are you suggesting a variation? No, I'm suggesting uh, the original um, motion should be uh, supported. So I'll be voting against this. Um, I think uh, that uh, this is totally missing um, the point in terms of understanding the role of uh, elected members. And um, I'm happy to move the original motion um, as printed if this motion fails. Can I do that, Lord Mayor? Okay. Yeah. Um, I'd also um, make uh, the point with respect to the pigeon that, you know, yes, it has been controversial. There are different views. That's precisely what um, art is meant to do. It's meant to be provocative. It's meant to get people talking, talking about the city, talking about the place, talking about the artwork. And there's been a lot of that over the last week. And I think that's a really good thing, um, getting people talking about our city at this time. So let's not go down this path. It's a slippery slope when politicians start dictating what art should be uh, rolled out in the city. That's not the sort of vision I want for Adelaide, particularly one that has such a proud tradition of celebrating the arts. Uh, I have Councillor Abraham today. Oh, oh sorry, Councillor Cross. You are correct, and then Councillor Abbey. I was wondering if the uh, mover of the variation would look at, um, or a variation, the variation, um, if we can change it to the value of um, instead of 50,000 to 100,000, um, purely because, I mean, 50,000 doesn't get you much. Um, so you can do a, a mural will cost you that fifty thousand dollars. So um, I'm wondering if we can change it to a hundred thousand, and also instead of for approval, can we put for noting? Because his intent here, as I understand it, is for us to know what the public art have um, approved and what what we are looking at putting out in the city. I get what the deputy lord mayor is saying. I understand that that we do not have a say in what the uh, the public art that goes out there. And and I must make a note that yes, I do agree with Councillor Sims that you know art is subjective and it's at a, actually you know you always get a controversial viewpoint on art. But I'm just in purpose of you know ensuring that. Um, we can, you know, we don't get bogged down on the art instead of the actual spend. Um, if we can stay, make those two changes. To Deputy Lord Mayor, are you happy to change it to 100,000 for noting? I'll accept 100,000, but on the subsequent variation. Uh, and Councillor Kerr, are you but happy to accept that? And what am I approving? Am I approving the, the spend or am I approving? You're approving the spend. Um, but the spend is connected to the art, so you can't approve the spend without knowing what the art is. So it, you can't you can't actually separate the art from the spend. So um, so uh, there's a zero zero missing on that hundred thousand. 
Um, uh, second, are you happy to? Um, the Deputy Lord Mayor has not accepted the variation to 19. The, the Deputy Lord Mayor on that one, but it doesn't uh, look like he's uh, stuck on that. I'm a bit worried that with this um, policy that we're going to get stuck on um, discussing the art rather than the spent. And I do understand that, you know, um, coming, we're in financial times where uh, everything is questioned to where we spend money. Um, and I do um, understand the intent of what this variation, what he's doing here, because we are accountable to the public and we're accountable in regards to the spend. But, you know, when I was 10 years old and the malls, malls were put in Rundra Mall and, you know, everyone hated it. Uh, when the pigs were uh, put in the mall, everyone hated it. Um, and, you know, they were they were squealing um, with disgust in regards to the pigs. So I, um, I, I just think that it's, um, you know, art is continuously and always will be um, a topic that everyone will have an opinion on and they freely should have an opinion on. Opinion on. It should be voiced. It should create conversation, it should create delight, it should create sadness, make you cry, make you laugh, do anything. But I don't want to get bogged in that, down on that. And if he could possibly agree to changing it from noting, I could approve this, but for approval, I just don't know what we're approving it for. Um, and if it's about the spend, I get that. If it's about the art, I'm not sure. Uh, Councillor Abraham today. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I uh, completely agree with uh, Councillor Kouros. I don't necessarily want to uh, spend time uh, looking at art projects. We're here to look at public policy, uh, not necessarily to uh, to look at art. So I uh, would like to, uh, again, um, uh, ask DLM whether if he would uh, accept noting rather than approval, because at the moment this uh, alternative motion to me it looks like a military coup on uh, on the pigeons. <laughs> a coup? <laughs> I will be flocking to them all. Um, uh, Councillor Kerry, you had a, oh, you didn't no, speak before. You. I did actually have Councillor no. Kerry then Councillor Martin. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, look, um, I'll just say to the outset, I'm a fan of the pigeon. Um, I'm a fan of the pigeon, and uh, I um, I. I don't believe that had this policy uh, change been in place, I don't believe that we would not have seen the pigeon. I would have voted for the pigeon. Uh, for the record, I think it's uh, it's a, it's quite a cool, uh, you know, it's like a pigeon out of the movie The Matrix, and it's kind of you know it's a kind of thing that we'll get kids saying, "Daddy, Mummy, I, I want to go see the pigeon." Um, it's a good thing. If the cost is pretty robust, uh, but then again, these structures have got to be robust. Uh, to last 100 years to be anchored to the ground so someone doesn't take it away, so they can mount it uh, in their front yard. Um, but having said that, Councillor Kouros's uh, concerns about this, I think it's quite interesting. I think Councillor Kouros, in a way, has actually answered her own concerns and articulated her answer because Councillor Kouros herself has recognised uh, that art is, uh, you know, there's a broad spectrum when you evaluate art. It's got to be challenging, it's about usual. What Council of Kirikos has done is demonstrated that actually councillors aren't people to be afraid of when it comes to making decisions on big ticket items. This argument, Lord Mayor, this argument that councillors since put forward that, oh, well, it's artistic integrity, you can't have people. This, uh, look, I run an art gallery. Uh, let me tell you who decides what art goes on the walls in the gallery. Uh, it's me. It's not the artist, it's me. I look at the art before it goes on the wall. I make sure that I see every <laughs> single piece of art before it goes up on the wall in my gallery. That is how the world works. And what you're doing is you're basically saying, well, uh, we don't want this group of people making a decision. This is big ticket items only, presumably. We don't want this group of people making a decision. Uh, we want this group over here to make a decision because ultimately it's going to be a group of people in administration. I don't think we should be so afraid and so terrified of the public via their elected councillors actually having some final say. I mean, this is just a yay or nay, it's a veto, of just being informed as to what is going up. This is not saying council will come and actually draw the art or make any changes. They will still be presented with the option that we fully formed by the administration. So I think actually, particularly given the current crisis and the current awareness of budgetary spend, I think it's actually an appropriate time to, 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 to do this. 
and to maybe just test the waters and see maybe we shouldn't be so afraid of the people via their councillors having final say. Maybe uh, it might just be for the best. Um, I have Councillor Martin and then... Uh, I had a question, Lord Mayor. I had Councillor Martin first. Sorry. It was actually... A... And then I'll go to you. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, can I just uh, remind councillors in considering uh, the point of view that's being put by Councillor Kira, uh, that his gallery has closed. Um, Lord Mayor, I wish to ask a question of the Cap administration. Councillor I wish to ask a question of the administration in relation to the council policy on public art associated with capital works developments. Could you please explain to the elected body what that policy is? CEO. Thanks, Queen. Uh, through the presiding member, um, the current um, endorsed policy is that 1.3% uh, of capital spend is uh, spent on public art. And so 1.3% 1, 1 of the Gawler Place works went to art, 1.3% of the capital works in the Central Market Arcade Redevelopment will go to public art and so on and so forth. Thank you very much. Um, just, for clarification. Just to the total capital program. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It's not not necessarily not the not way that you no, just no, describe it, Councillor Martin. Yes. It's I understand the title. that, and I do understand how it works. I, I was simply asking uh, for the explanation. Um, look, Lord Mayor, um, I am not a fan of uh, uh, the pigeon, um, and in fact, I was on the public run, art roundtable that considered uh, the competing works, um, and uh, you know that's uh, that's art. Some of us like it, some of us hate it. Um, I thought it was uh, a little underwhelming, but the point is that we're all talking about it. Uh, there are some people who love it, uh, and there are some people who will detest it even more than I do. But the point here, the significant point, is that um, artistic endeavour should never be subjected to political influences. Um, wherever that has happened, it, it's come unstuck. And in this instance, um, uh, the outcome may not be to everybody's liking, but it has been unfettered by the judgment of people who are sensitive to pressure from public. Artistic endeavor has always thrived because it is absolutely independent. It is the will of the people who, who are practicing their art. And they practice their art um, because there are processes that allow them to do so. Uh, and indeed, in this case, where the artist came forward, um, there was a, a, a competitive process, um, CVs, models, the whole kit and caboodle. It was a very thorough process. To then process um, with a, uh, and I do, I do get uh, what the Deputy Lord Mayor is saying, I do understand, but to burden that process with then a layer of bureaucracy that requires approval or even noting uh, invites even wider interference in the arts. And where does it stop then? Is there then a recommended list of books to read? Are there some books that are not appropriate? Um, in, uh, Michael Trump, both. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. And let, let me just say to Councillor Kira. So, so, no, sorry, sorry, please stay with the motion. Thank you. No, Thank it's you. A, it's, a, it's a perfect, perfect illustration. Bookshops do not survive these days uh, because of competition. But nevertheless, uh, books can be read freely. There is no body over uh, looking what is published. There's no government official saying this is not recommended reading. In fact, in this country, we used to have that when I was growing up. You couldn't read something like Portnoy's complaint uh, because politicians had decided that it would corrupt the minds of the people of this country. Now to impose this level of censorship on art is extremely dangerous. Uh, and I, I will vote against this uh, because the principle has been demonstrated to have failed and failed consistently in the history, not only of this country, but around the world. Deputy Lord Mayor, you had a question? Um, yeah, only that if hypothetically it was come to, to come to council for noting, uh, procedurally, how would that, how would the administration see that process unfolding? Would that be for noting 
say, for example, after the Public Art Roundtable has made a recommendation, but before the procurement process has concluded, as in the contract's been signed, or just curious as to where it would fit into the scheme of things? CEO. Through you, Lord Mayor, that's something that we would need to, to carefully consider. Can I just say, I do concede that because this project has spanned two council groups, there would have been a, a lack of awareness from some of you sitting around this table tonight, and that's unfortunate. It is a long-term project. We're talking about a project that has taken two years from beginning to end. Ordinarily, you would think that a project could be undertaken within one cycle of the council, and you would have had much more intimate knowledge of, of the project. Um, I'm happy to work through a process that can give you some comfort that you will understand what is being developed and, and the timeframes. So we would provide that information to you on a rolling basis. Um, and when I reflect on this, maybe there was an absence of that occurring in this regard. So I, I, you know, I, I feel comfortable that we could notify you what's happening, when it's happening, and you would be much more informed and we could, we could put that process in place. Well, subsequently, then I'm happy to accept Councillor Curris's variation for noting. Thank you. If we can actually put that variation, then I just look to Councillor Kerr for your support of that change. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. I had Councillor Mackey. Uh, thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, as somebody who has spent 21 years being a bookseller and 13 years anchoring an art gallery concurrently, um, and more than a, a decade leading the state's uh, cultural bureaucracy um, and having um, worked both with local government, with the state government and with the Australian government through the Australia Council uh, in arm's length peer adjudication processes. I absolutely just want to remind my colleagues here that there had been decades and decades of precedent um, about the virtue of politicians remaining at arm's length from the decisions about public art and indeed really more about um, that grant-based, project-based arts funding. Um, trial and error for decades uh, and politicians getting into uh, all sorts of difficulty and setting themselves up as arbiters of, of, um, a, a, in a curatorial uh, sense. Um, uh, invariably leads to grief. Um, we have in the City of Adelaide uh, a long, well-established and quite mature process for the selection, the commissioning and se selection and commissioning of public art. I don't like everything that um, uh, ends up in the public realm, but it's actually not about me. It's actually about a conversation that happens within a community, within a society, um, about ideas and art reflects, and in this case on a shiny object, a shiny pigeon, absolutely reflects in multifaceted ways um, uh, um, uh, ideas. Um, I, I, I'm very, very uncomfortable from a good public policy perspective of inserting, I, I, I hear and am grateful um, for the Chief Executive's reflection on uh, ways to ensure that more information flows uh, to um, uh, elected members in an information sharing sense, but I absolutely warn us all against the idea of becoming the approvers or the interferers with a process that is not actually bureaucratically determined, it's actually determined by uh, panels that our administration appoints of experts. Uh, and likewise, with a whole range of other grants, we, we bring together experts, peers who can provide considered advice. Um, it, it, um, it, it can make for a, a nice, easy headline um, to argue publicly about um, uh, the virtue or otherwise of, of an in individual object. And that should happen anyway. But I, honestly, we our policy position is we have a framework. Our policy position is we approve through the annual budget process and allocation of funds. And then we have a process uh, that elicits the result. I, I, I would therefore speak, uh, I, I won't be voting for this amendment motion. Um, members, I think um, if I could just say, 
a few words that obviously oh, I've got to do it. The pigeons ruffled a few feathers around the city. Those that love it and those that don't. But actually that is what public art is supposed to do. And um, we've spent many years, those of us that have worked in the arts to make sure that it's peer assessed and not actually going through bureaucracies or two political uh, members to make a discussion. Um, I'm not talking to this. What I did actually want to do is just um, give my thanks to the team and Christy um, and Anne for the work that was done on the refresh of the cultural strategy. Um, what they've done in refocusing around artists and artisans, around festivals, around public art, and of course our designation as UNESCO City of Music is fantastic and they've really refined our focus so that we get a very clear strategy and uh, if we're able to deliver even half of that in the remainder of this term of council, our city will be all the richer for it. Um, so I just wanted to uh, thank you for the work that you've done, uh, and Claire, of course, um, and uh, uh, if we can actually then go to Deputy Lord Mayor to sum up. Thanks, Lord Mayor, and I appreciate the vigilance of, uh, the, 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 the vigilance of Councillor Sims and Councillor Mackey um, with regards to keeping uh, politicians at arm's length. Um, from the arts, that's what was in there at three. And and, uh, and look, and I appreciate Councillor Mackey's points around we set a budget, um, and so presumably anything within that budget um, is okay for spending. Uh, I I appreciate the um, CEO's conciliatory remarks that this budget was actually set, the ball was rolling before this term of council. Um, uh, nevertheless, uh, I was not pleased um, uh, to have been tarred and feathered by members of the public uh, who, who found it to be an unreasonably high amount of money that was spent on it. Um, notwithstanding, it may well be quality art, and I think it, in discussing some of the specifics, um, I was quite pleased to learn that something like 15 different people were employed on the project. Um, and so it wasn't just one creative who's not on job seeker, it was perhaps 15 people um, who were given work throughout this, and that's reassuring. Um, uh, and look, and, and given the, the varied the varied motion um, now has it for noting, look, the, it was always intended that the original process would always run and things would come for recommendation or not. But um, uh, look, for noting, uh, I'm far more comfortable with that. Like I said, I'm happy to defend the pigeon, but I just, I needed to know about it first. And I felt that it was a, a serious failure of process um, that councillors were not notified about it. Um, beforehand. Now, regardless of whether this motion uh, wins or loses, uh, it seems that the administration will fix that. Um, and I appreciate uh, the uh, fixing up and, and plugging of holes in the process as it, as it exists today. Um, uh, by and large, uh, I think we do do a good job. Um, I take slight umbrage with Councillor Mackey's um, argument that there's not much bureaucracy involved. My mind boggles at, at, the, at a reference group, a round table, and a project control group, I must confess. Um, uh, but look, it seems to have worked uh, to date, notwithstanding some cost implications. Um, so look, I hope this motion can be supported. And uh, indeed, uh, when it comes to revealing artworks, um, it wouldn't be envisaged that this would actually come through on the public agenda um, either, uh, because uh, councillors need to be uh, briefed uh, in, a, in a manner that is consistent with the overall unveiling of the artwork. Um, uh, that needs to be uh, out of respect for the, to the artists that made it, uh, but also so that it can be a bit of a surprise on a Friday um, and so we can all enjoy it over the weekend. So that would be, that would very much be the intent. Don't want to, uh, don't want to ruin or, or steal the show by something coming through on some trap uh, agenda. We'd still like a bit of fanfare around it if this motion would be successful. Thank you, members, to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Thank you, members. We now go to um, 10, 17, the Hutt Street Centre. And I'll look for a mover, Deputy Lord Mayor. And I'll look for a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Canole. Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, just briefly at the outset, Lord Mayor, I just want to thank uh, the staff that were involved in this process. Um, I understand for some members it wasn't easy and they still take uh, or have in principle opposition to conducting this review. Um, uh, it was labelled a witch hunt, it was labelled all manner of things. Um, well, clearly it wasn't a witch hunt. Uh, what it was, uh, was this council seeking 
uh, to reaffirm its position, to understand the planning law, as it were, uh, and to give a definitive answer to this matter, one way or the other. Um, I believe that this council, at least those that uh, wanted this review uh, to occur, so we could put the matter to bed one way or the other, um, showed immense leadership. They showed leadership uh, in the face of uh, very heinous slurs against them. Uh, they showed leadership in the face of what were effectively political threats against them. Uh, they showed leadership even when their own reputation uh, was on the line. They did the right thing. Uh, and uh, in doing so, uh, they've managed to do what the previous council could not do, uh, which is actually provide leadership on this matter and provide an answer from the council's perspective. Because um, that's what all this was about. And I'm so pleased that it's managed to occur in a way that has not actually uh, cost this charity uh, anything or at least anything substantial. Um, uh, this review, as it should have been, was conducted by the City of Adelaide to see whether or not we as a planning authority uh, were doing the right thing, or whether or not everyone that we're responsible for in that particular precinct was doing the right thing as well. Uh, it effect effectively tied up uh, some rather substantial loose ends. Uh, I think it's important, and it's important as well for the community, because uh, this issue has very, very sadly, and I'm, I'm sad Councillor Moran is not here, this issue has been the cause of much division in the community, unnecessarily, because the question that this chamber should have always asked is the one that is answered in attachment A to item 1017 on this agenda. That's the question that should have been asked. That's the only question that should have been asked. Not this ridiculous notion um, about bringing in security guards uh, and beating it up in the media for one's own a political gain and media presence. It's really shameful that those things occurred, Lord Mayor. Really, really quite shameful because all it did was breed division in the community. And this, this is the beginning uh, of the healing process for those people in the southeastern corner of the city. Uh, it provides an answer to them. It answers their concerns that the council assessment panel could not answer because it said, uh, quote unquote, a higher order, a higher authority needed to answer these questions. Uh, it provides certainty to those in the precinct. Um, and I think uh, on balance overall, uh, look, it is interesting uh, that uh, as it were, there is no, there is just 30 seconds more if I may, um, uh, that even though in original representations, the Hutt Street Centre said, look, we're not gonna have more than 40 people a day. Um, and we have that and the council has that and that's on the, on the record. Um, uh, that it's ballooned five times more, um, uh, that that is acceptable without any further approvals. That was, that was interesting, uh, but look, that's the law and the best opinion, well, that is at least the best opinion we have on the law and that's what we need to follow. Um, uh, so I wanna thank the administration involved in uh, bringing this to us. Uh, I want to thank the reviewers as well uh, for the work that they've done. Uh, and I want to commend those councillors that took the leadership uh, or had the leadership that was needed uh, to put this issue to bed once and for all. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, Councillor Knoll? Uh, Councillor Sims? Thanks, Lord Mayor. I um, wasn't intending on uh, speaking on this, but um, once again, the uh, outgoing Deputy Lord Mayor has um, provoked me to uh, speak. Lord Mayor, through you, the, the Deputy Lord Mayor um, has a very unusual um, view on leadership. If he thinks that it is good leadership for this council to be demonising an organisation that supports the most vulnerable people in our community in the middle of the worst economic crisis that has been seen in generations, that's not my idea of leadership. And I can tell you, talking to residents and ratepayers over the last six months when Councillor Hyde kicked this hornet's nest and put the issue back on the agenda, it's not the view that most residents and ratepayers have of leadership either. It's not what they expected from this council. When there are people who have lost their jobs, when there are more and more people experiencing significant economic stress and pressures, more and more people seeking the support of an organisation like the Hutt Street Centre, what they want is the City Council to get behind those organisations and support them, not looking at ways that we can make life more difficult for them. And that's what this review did. It created months of uncertainty for the Hutt Street Centre at a time when it should have been focused on its core business, 
that is helping the most vulnerable people in our community. I think it's been a very dark and embarrassing chapter for this City Council, and I hope that it does not set a precedent for other planning decisions in the future, where if we have a group of residents or other proponents who are not happy with a planning decision, that they come to Councillor Hyde and say, bring it into Town Hall and let's reopen the whole matter and undermine the integrity of our planning process. I really hope that this isn't a precedent uh, for that kind of intervention in the future. I hope that it is the end of this crusade that has been mounted by some members of this council against the Hutton Street Centre. I hope that those members of council that have been prosecuting that will drop it and now focus on what we should all be doing at this time of crisis, and that is focusing on trying to help the most vulnerable people in our community and focusing on trying to help those organisations that stand with them. Um, so I certainly don't share Councillor Hyde's view that this has been an example of leadership from the council, anything but. I hope that we now draw a line in the sand under this, move on, and uh, that we don't see this uh, being repeated in the future. Councillor Kerrin. Well, thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, unfortunately, uh, sadly, I do agree with Councillor Sims uh, to a small extent. It has been uh, it has been a dark and embarrassing time uh, to some extent, and for some individuals, uh, but not because of anything that Councillor that the Deputy Lord Mayor did, and not because of anything that the councillors who supported the motion into uh, the advice did. Uh, let's not forget, it was not the Deputy Lord Mayor, it was not the councillors who supported this motion. Uh, who called residents in the southeastern corner rednecks, Lord Mayor. It was not the Deputy Lord Mayor or anyone who spoke in favour of this motion who called, who demonised and traduced ordinary, decent, uh, respect, uh, respectful uh, citizens of southeast corner as rednecks, Lord, uh, Lord Mayor. Uh, it was the politically motivated opposition uh, who were grandstanding to do it for their own uh, feeble political profiles. Let's face facts. So I would completely, uh, I, I would say on this matter, I do hope that subsides. I do hope the politicising of this matter subsides. No one, no one down to a T, nobody in this room, I could say quite surely, wanted a reduction in services for the homeless. No one. And that is manifest from the votes, uh, the unanimous votes that have come, uh, passed on uh, funding for the homeless. No one wanted a reduction in homeless uh, services. Um, and to suggest that and to uh, impugn the integrity of ordinary decent folk, I think it speaks for itself. I think there is a heavy level of projection coming here from certain councillors. Councillor Kerrer, Councillor Kerrer, Councillor Kerrer, Councillor Kerrer, that's enough, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Knoll. I think there is, uh, when we looked at the, 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 the intent of the, the motion in the first instance, so the objective here was not about the Hutt Street Centre and the services it's providing. The objective is to settle an argument, to settle an ongoing, uh, uh, um, you know, something that was quite unclear, and to be able to it to be set aside to ensure that you know this this issue, this ongoing argument, can be settled. And that was the purpose. And uh, and I think that was what this has done, and the council has done that on behalf of the, of the community in a sense. Uh, you had a group of, of businesses, etc., uh, following their, their process, and and uh, you know in, they're looking after their best interests and seeing what they could do uh, from their perspective. I mean, the purpose here was it's now it is now uh, uh, underpinned that they were doing things within their their legal rights and saying that this is acceptable and it's not a change of of the, of the usage, etc. And argument finished. It's no longer the, they can no longer use that argument. Uh, in, in trying to find ways to, uh, you know, further their own uh, needs for their businesses, etc. And this is a set as an objective. It was to settle uh, the issues and then, you know, and then start again so that, uh, uh, you know, it is uh, going forward and it has been, uh, uh, you know, made very clear that uh, uh, they are, you know, progressing in their own, you know, what they're, what they're here to do and one hopes uh, that with time, uh, the, the services, etc., will alleviate these issues and uh, continuing on uh, and enabling people to do this uh, and doing it from home or wherever the residences are. So one hopes that they continue on their work, but it's no longer an argument on the street uh, about whether they're legitimacy or not. Councillor Martin. Thank 
you, Lord Mayor. Um, look, I endorse entirely what's uh, been said by Councillor Sims. Uh, I am disappointed that one of the hallmarks of this council has been its obsession in pursuing the Hutt Street Centre. And Lord Mayor, I was always disappointed that it was your vote, your casting vote, that led to this inquiry into the Hutt Street Centre. Correct. It, it was, in my view, uh, an abrogation of leadership. It was the time at which this council needed to say, at the height of the pandemic, we support the Hutt Street Centre and the services it is providing to the community. That's what we should have done. But instead, we pursued them. And, you know, that that act, um, you know, that grave act is uh, compounded, and I think to the discredit of those who do it, by people seeking to blame others for this, uh, by seeking to suggest that somehow there was a problem made by other people. Uh, this problem was created by the city of Adelaide, by councillors, who decided at that inopportune moment to investigate uh, what is probably one of the best providers of services to the homeless in the state. Uh, and Lord Mayor, um, don't believe me on this. There's a Legislative Council Select Committee that is still considering this, that will deliver a report. And it may well be that this, this city, this council will be referenced in that report. I think it's highly likely. I think it's going to name people as well. And when it does so, I hope that this council will realise that what it's participated in has devalued our standing in the community. Lord Mayor, uh, I, I do hope though, and, and I, I am prepared now to move on, um, and I hope that everybody else is, but I do hope that we do move on. And, and I give notice that if this brews again, this council needs to be on top of it. And, and I say particularly, if the Hutt Street traders begin agitating again, and particularly those who are receiving council funding through the Precinct Association funding, I will move in this chamber as quick as a flash that that funding is withdrawn, because this matter is done and it needs to be dusted and they need to understand it. Councillor Kouros. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I just want to point out a few things from this report. And one of them was that this, is, this has been an issue with the traders since 1994. It's not new. It's not something that this council has put forward. It's not something that this council has disrupted. It is a, a, a process that needed to be uh, needed to be gone through because we are accountable to the ratepayers. That's who we are accountable to. This is what they were asking for. And I do thank um, during this. I'm very grateful that during this investigation that they actually sat down with the traders and with the Hutt Street Centre and they spoke to get all, all together in one room and talked about their grievances and their problems. Hopefully from that they've come to some conclusion or some understanding because I have to tell you that last term of council the behaviour on some motions in regards to the Hutt Street and the Hutt Street Centre were appalling. They did not come from this council, they came from the previous council. CCTV, a, a police station to be put on Hutt Street, uh, security guards. I mean, it's, it's endless. It, that was the last term of council. It was not. Excuse me, members. Council. And let's be clear on that, uh, Lord Mayor. Let's Councillor be clear Martin, on that. can you stop Where interrupting Councillor Cross, please? It has created division. It has created a disruption in the area. It has made people not want to set up a business because of the stigma that was created from the councillors of the last term of council. And I'm not naming any names. I'm not pointing in figure, fingers. Okay. But I would not do that because I do not want to be that person. But let's just take it for what it is and let's just accept for what it is. Because the fact of the matter is, it's not new. It's not something that's just been created. It has been an issue and it has been addressed. And like Deputy Lord Mayor said, it is a time for healing. It is a time for finding solutions. It is a time for the businesses or the people on Hutt Street that have had their issues with the Hutt Street Centre to actually come together and find a solution to, to get through this and actually thrive as a community. That's what this is, this is about. It's not against homelessness. 
It's not against what the Hutt Street does. It's not against anything of that. And I would not be labelled as a person, as a villain in this, because I voted for this to be happened. I would not be that, I would not be that person. And I am not that person. I like to consider both sides of the argument and we have done that. It's been delivered to them. It's been investigated. Sure, there was a cost associated with it, but maybe we won't have to refer to anything back again. We can just move forward and just heal. Thank you, councillors. Um, I do support the Hutt Street Centre. I do support the services they provide. I have for many years. I did meet with the Hutt Street Centre before the vote. They agreed that this matter needed to be put to bed. Um, and I personally and still believe that this report will help resolve the issues that have been carrying on in that street for far too long. Uh, I think that we as a council have been great supporters of homeless services in the city, including being foundation partners of the Adelaide Zero project and all the other services in the city. And I take offence at the suggestion that in supporting this going forward so that we could get this review and put this matter to bed once and for all, that I in some way am being painted as someone who does not support homelessness services and does not support the Hart Street Centre. I meet on a regular basis with the Hart Street Centre with the chair and the CEO and the previous chair and the previous CEO and have done a lot of work in this area voluntarily in my personal time as well. So I would just like to say to my council Council, as you have all talked about us moving on, that we could for once perhaps act like adults and act reasonably and compassionately about the people that we're talking about and put this matter to bed and move on from here. <coughs> Deputy Lord Mayor, if you'd like to sum up. Uh, well, thank you for that, Lord Mayor. Um, look, first up, I just want to correct, I didn't want to interrupt councillors. Um, while they were doing their speeches, but uh, for Councillor Sims to, uh, to try and categorise this as a crusade, I'll just highlight to Councillor Sims and remind him um, that the only time I brought this matter to Council was when I brought the original motion which has produced this work. Um, the only thing I've been interested in the whole time is the truth, is the truth. The truth about uh, what the current situation is, the truth around what the law is, the truth around um, uh, around what our obligations are. Um, and this is what this has delivered us, as best we know. It's delivered us the truth. Of course, when we're looking at the truth, we know the truth be told, Councillor Martin's friend, Frank Pangala, was on, the, was on that Legislative Council Committee. Councillor Sims's friend, Tammy Franks, is on the Legislative Council Committee that's doing that inquiry. Um, and so they will very much continue their witch hunt and, and what have you. Um, uh, and that's their prerogative. And I know Councillor Martin's attended there and, uh, and under parliamentary privileges, living certain allegations um, around what he thinks the matter is. But truth be told as well, uh, Councillor Sims says uh, that this created a whole heap of uncertainty for the Hutt Street Centre. But as you just said, Lord Mayor, um, you met with them and they wanted this matter dealt with. Um, and in actual fact, their CEO, Chris Burns, was on the public record uh, saying that he's confident in their position. Um, uh, so, so truth be told, Councillor Sims wasn't really telling the truth there, was he? Was being a bit, uh, being a bit liberal with Counts, it. Counts. Um, but, uh, uh, but look, Lord Mayor, I, I'm very pleased to see um, that this council is willing to move forward. Um, uh, I do think there is more work to be done uh, in the precinct. There is far, far more work to be done uh, around public safety, around public amenity, around making sure. Um, everyone is catered for in the area. And, and of course, that's why uh, this council unanimously gave the Hutt Street Centre $50,000 this year, alongside other homelessness providers. And I'm so pleased um, that one of the first motions I moved in this chamber was to provide more funding to homelessness, um, which was just slightly shy of what we spent on the pigeon this year. But um, uh, look, Lord Mayor, the report is clear, uh, and it says that we are not responsible for what happens in the public realm uh, or in the public. Uh, with regards to community safety. Uh, it's clear that there are issues there and on face value the reviewer accepted that there are a huge amount of social issues in the street. Um, and we tested the veracity of that in committee and I was, I was uh, interested to see his response and, and he took them at face value. Um, uh, and he, he acknowledges that there is an impact there on Hutt Street, there is a social impact and there is an economic impact. 
Um, he also acknowledges that it is actually the South Australian government's role uh, to police what happens in the precinct. It is the job of the South Australian police uh, and the South Australian government. Um, uh, and so, just if I can have 20 more seconds. Um, members, members, thank you. So we can be confident um, uh, that as soon as this matter popped up for council, as soon as questions were put to us, uh, we grabbed the issue, we grabbed the ball by the horns, we wrestled the matter down, and we've now put the matter to bed. Uh, as again, this is about truth telling. Uh, the truth is that the city of Adelaide has fully complied with its obligations. And I remind members that if we did not verify our legal position, if we didn't do that, and then we're then taken to court after the fact, you're looking at millions upon millions of dollars in damages. Uh, so we, uh, that would have been an unacceptable risk. We've now put that risk to bed. Uh, many in the community uh, are pleased at least to have an answer, even if they're not pleased with the answer. Uh, and so I hope that we can all move forward uh, together. Members to the vote, those in favour, those against, that is carried. Um, members, oh, it's just coming up 7.30, we still have uh, three reports before we get to the confidential items, so I think we might have a break now. Um, I'd suggest, uh, say, 20 minutes. Is that going to give everybody enough time to have a break, something to eat? Excellent. I'll see you both in the chamber in at quarter to eight.
<laughs> we are on uh, 10.18, which is the 2020-2021 quarter one finance report. Move from mover, Councillor Martin, and a seconder, please. <laughs> Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Uh, Councillor Martin. Yeah, Lord Mayor, I, I wanted to move an alternative motion. Do we have that? No. Uh, no, no, I've just drafted it. Um, and it's to add a, a four to what's there. And it is establishes a COVID finance committee made up of all elected members to allow the administration to present comma for immediate review the impacts on our staff and our ratepayers of the proposed cuts and to consider um, to consider any available alternatives. I withdraw my seconding. Councillor Sims has seconded that. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, uh, before I start uh, uh, speaking to this motion, may I ask a couple of questions of the administration? You may. Thank you. Um, uh, the first question is related to staffing levels. Uh, I discern from the uh, financial plan figures that our staffing costs will reduce uh, by June 30th from around 78 million to 71 million. Um, there has been much speculation in the advertiser about how many staff are leaving um, uh, from figures of 400 uh, to in a second phase 235 roles um, uh, and there's talk of others moving about. Can the administration provide a clear uh, unequivocal assessment of the numbers of staff who left. We know from the question on notice in um, uh, July uh, that that figure for trainees, casuals, fixed term and others was close to 170. What has occurred since? Uh, has the advertiser got it right or wrong? See ya. Through Lord Mayor, look, I believe this is quite a complex thing to answer in a public forum without preparation tonight. I'd prefer to take that on nice notice and provide absolute clarity at the next meeting. And uh, when you provide that absolute clarity, CEO, uh, through you, Lord Mayor, of course, um, will that information be public or confidential? See you. Through you, Lord Mayor. Staffing mat matters to do with staffing. I generally like to keep confidential, but but um, I'm happy to provide global numbers for you so that um, you can be quite openly aware of what's occurred. Um, <clears throat> and I think it's, it's good to correct the public record. So my intention would be to provide it in open agenda as far as practical. Thank you. Um, additionally, uh, um, and uh, uh, just uh, a minor question. I, I did not notice in reading these papers for committee that our electricity consumption uh, appears to have increased by 5.5% because I took that to mean there had been an increase in cost. But on rereading, am I to understand that the City of Adelaide is now consuming 5.5% more power in QF1? Yeah, through your Lord that is correct. Um, that is a question I followed up on today. It is just a, a greater consumption than was anticipated. Um, is that common? An increase of that nature, for, especially for a, a city concentrating on carbon emissions? Yeah. Um, 
I can't answer that sitting here, but I will take on notes. Okay. Um, the QF1 report is forecasting we'll need to borrow uh, almost $93 million by the end of the financial year, and that could go up further if other measures are approved. Uh, will the City of Adelaide have reached its uh, regulatory prudential limit uh, with that level of borrowings? Say on. No, through you, Lord Mayor. First of all, these matters could have been dealt with in committee. Um, that's where we tabled this report for, for questions and answers. So um, I'd urge council members generally to ask those questions when I have all the available staff. In answer to this particular question, no, it won't. I'm sorry, I, I, I know that asking questions is a problem. I Thank you, uh, Councillor Lord Mayor. Martin. It's not a problem asking questions. We have a committee to deal with the ability for all members to ask questions of all reports at committee um, when we have all the staff available. No, that's fine. I, I just thought the CEO uh, and uh, um, his director would be across that. Okay. Um, look, Lord Mayor, um, I, I, uh, I have to say that uh, this report is disturbing. Um, the audit committee is hearing alarm bells. Uh, I'm probably on behalf of ratepayers, our net outlays on uh, new and upgraded assets at uh, page 325 are, uh, are falling from 31 million down to 25, then to 14 million the year after that. Uh, we're not maintaining our assets in line with the Local Government Act, uh, falling behind with levels of spending and uh, our capital outlays are scheduled to increase dramatically the end of the decade, that is to say we're leaving it for future councils. And uh, the solution in, in all of this, uh, this, this huge debt, and, and by the way, Lord Mayor, it's 93 million, 90 million going to 114 million the year after, according to the long-term financial plan. And, and the solution that I, I'm hearing from the team is that we will sack our way out of our financial problems. Councillor, councillor, thank you very much. If you haven't got anything better to contribute than um, some rude remarks, I'd ask you to... Well, no, to it's them. not rude, Lord Mayor. Well, it is, Councillor Martin. Well, uh, I'm sorry that you take offence, but let me assure you that our staff take even greater offence. They are losing their jobs because of our financial circumstances, and the only solution that I'm hearing is we're removing people. And so the intention of this motion is for us to establish uh, a group, a working group made up of all councillors so that we can hear all of the arguments in favour of this because they've never been discussed in any kind of committee that I'm aware of, uh, even though there have been undertakings that there would be that discussion. And given that this is you know, a, a pressing matter, in fact, we're talking about removing people um, before the new year or by January, 18th, is it, or the 8th? Um, we actually need to have a discussion. And it's not only, you know, the, uh, the interests of our staff and our ratepayers that we need to be looking at. Um, I'm hearing from uh, others like the union movement that the economic impact of what's happening in the city of Adelaide is far from uh, what it's painted as a, a means of getting us out of this crisis, going to create an even bigger crisis in the city of Adelaide. And in fact, on radio this morning, the Australian Services Union was saying that what we're doing is effectively shutting down about five West End breweries in terms of the economic impact, if indeed 400 uh, positions are going. So uh, here we are removing people um, when Every other government, I mean the state government today, is is working hard. I want to work on the man. Can we talk to the motion? Yeah, that's, the motion. that's the motion. That's, that's the motion. That's the motion. Now I understand there's embarrassment from Team Adelaide about this, but Lord Councillor, Mayor, I'm Councillor asking... Martin, thank you. Please sit down. I'm not going to stand anyone else calling each other names, talking about factions, whatever. We're here to debate. We're not here to actually cast aspersions at each other. Um, I'll ask you to sit down. Councillor Sims, would you like to speak as a second to the motion? I'll present my right. Members, would anybody else like to speak? Deputy Lord Mayor, then Councillor Cross. Uh, very quickly, Lord Mayor, um, what is the point of having a finance committee that is made up of everyone here 
another committee. So we've got well, we have two committees a month. There'll be another COVID committee. Uh, we've got council as well, in addition to any other specials that can be called. Um, it's nonsensical, Lord Mayor. We have all the information that we need. Um, potentially, Councillor Martin does not have the most up-to-date information because he didn't bother to attend the briefing that was held for us on this specific matter. Uh, so I think it's rather improper to come and say, oh, we need more information, we need to discuss this, uh, when the opportunity to be updated on what is happening uh, was skimped out on by Councillor Martin and others who seriously have abrogated their responsibility. Lord Mayor, that abrogated I, I their have, responsibility. I have, Excuse me. I have a right to respond to that allegation. Well, no, it's the point of order. If it is, then you can tell me what the provision is within the Act for the point of order. Uh, the point of order, Lord Mayor, is that uh, it is not abrogating one's responsibility to, to not attend a meeting that is not properly constituted. The, just the point of order and the explanation. Thank you. Please be seated. Deputy Lord Mayor, please continue. Uh, and, and so to, to, to suggest that we need further information when one has not bothered to furnish themselves with the information that was available to them, uh, I think is, is not the right course of action. Um, this is merely a bureaucratic measure. And as well, I'm, uh, I'm as well conscious that uh, there were remarks made on the public record this morning by Councillor Martin, which alleged that we had not, have, had not had any formal meetings um, to talk about this matter. Uh, we hadn't had any formal meetings to talk about the restructure, uh, to talk about the effects on staff, uh, to unpack this in committee. Um, and there are actually at least four instances that I went through back through my records where I can see uh, reference in our budget papers uh, to the quantum of money that was budgeted for redundancies. Uh, we had a full, for the first time ever, and I commend the administration for providing it, we had a full and complete breakdown of the FTE in each service category, in each department. That is the first time ever that information has been on the public record for the City of Adelaide. Uh, and I think it's an important part of the process as well. Um, we then subsequently, in unpacking that at committee and noting that then at council, uh, we subsequently noted, we, we subsequently voted uh, when the administration felt they needed further uh, support from the council uh, to confirm that this is the approach we are taking, the approach we're taking with regards to our uh, uh, reimagining principles and the reshaping of the organisation and all that, that sort of stuff, uh, we then voted again on that. Now, I can't recall if there was a committee necessarily, but uh, my point is regarding four, we've already unpacked this, we've already considered it in a formal sense, we've already voted on it. The statements that were, that were made this morning that said there had not been any formal considerations uh, were, were blatant mistruths. Um, this is merely going Lord to Mayor, serve. That, that is not appropriate. Merely going and, to and serve. Councillor, if you're calling a point of order, I'd like to know what the yeah, point that's of a, order that's is. Yeah, that, that's a breach of the code of conduct to accuse me of telling a lie about the information. We have never been. Councillor, we have been informed of the information. Deputy Lord Mayor, oh, I'm sorry, you're about to run out of time. You have got a minute. Uh, no, no, that's that's fine. I was going to specifically point to the part of the schedule which defines code of conduct that Councillor Martin breached this morning, but there is no need to do that. I think he's fully aware now, and hopefully he's learned his lesson. Um, this is not necessary. It's bureaucratic. We've considered these matters formally. Uh, they've been unpacked. Uh, there is plenty of public scrutiny on them. If members wish to be furnished with further information, they can either bother attending briefings or they can put questions on notice. I have Councillor Kouros. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I was actually going to bring up the same thing that the Lord Mayor said. We have unpacked this. We have talked about this. We have been presented with the information. Um, we have gone through it. We have, it has gone in detail. So to do a committee on top of a committee on top of a committee, it's not necessary. We have gone through this very carefully. Um, I understand where Councillor Martin is coming from, but I think you've got to look at it in the context in the sense that, you know, we have unpacked this. We have, that work has been done on it. And we gave CEO a direction, he fulfilled that direction, and I have to commend the administration on the fantastic work that they have done. And you know they've communicated with us the whole way. They have, uh, you know, they have been really transparent with everything, and I do appreciate it. And we should, all should appreciate it. And we all have seen the work to it. So, echo everything that the deputy mayor has said in regards to you know um, the work that has been done and has been um, unfolded to us. Councillor Sims. Thanks.
thanks Lord Mayor. Um, I, I'm looking back to when um, the, the meeting when we first talked about the $20 million um, worth of savings. Um, and I, I bring that up not because I'm trying to um, go over the past, but I'm adding potentially a bit of context to the motion that um, Councillor Martin is putting forward, or at least explaining why uh, I am um, seconding it. Uh, when it was proposed at that time that we find um, $20 million worth of savings, I, I had some real concerns that we were making that decision without um, really discussing as a group collectively the implications, what that would mean for the organisation in terms of uh, staffing for the organisation, but also services for the organisation. Um, and I want to make it very clear, I'm not making a criticism of um, Council's executive team, who I think worked very hard to follow through on the directive of Council, which was to make $20 million worth of savings. The reality is, though, when you're making savings to your operations budget, that will result in the reduction of staff and in the reduction of community services. It has to, Lord Mayor. Where else is the, the savings going to come from? And in that context, I think having a committee like this would be really beneficial where we can actually talk about, as a collective group, the implications of that um, and talk about what that means for the services offering of the City of Adelaide going forward. I think that would be really worthwhile. Of course, we have had discussions in different contexts and there's been snippets of different discussions, but we haven't had a dedicated committee that's been able to work through these things in a systematic way. And I think this is going to be a long-term project. I'm not in favour of the target of $20 million savings that was set, but given Council has set that target, I would like the opportunity to talk about what that means in a more meaningful way. And so it's on that basis that I'm supporting um, the proposal of Council Martin. Thank well. you, Councillor Sims. Um, Zio, did you want to make any comments before I go back to the mover to someone? Yeah, three Lord Mayor. <clears throat> I'd like to clarify for the record the approach that the executive has taken in its reporting to council. There is some uncertainty regarding that. Um, it is correct to think that, to say that as the administration, we have reported to council on a relatively frequent basis. Um, and some of that has been in formal agenda. Some of it has been through uh, other forms of communication. Most recently, we held uh, a CEO briefing uh, which was an informal briefing, uh, which is designated as an informal gathering under the Local Government Act. And that briefing was completed fully in accordance with our policy and procedures for informal meetings. In fact, the Act is specifically designed to enable briefings like that to occur, so you, council members, can be fully aware of what the administration is doing. Um, I think that um, it's fair to say that given that the, the matters that were shared with members um, regard the, regarded the personal affairs of, of my staff through the reshaping process, that, that that session would be held in confidence because it's dealing with my staff. Um, so I, I maintain it is appropriate for me to call an informal briefing. It's appropriate for me to invite you to that to become fully informed. And I believe I've, I've fulfilled that requirement. Any changes to the structure of the organisation under the Local Government Act requires me as CEO to consult with you to a reasonable degree. It doesn't require me to seek your approval. It doesn't require me to do anything other than comply with the budget and to manage the organisation as I see fit. Now, I take that role very seriously, but I also take the, the fact that I need to liaise with you, work with you, and engage with you very seriously as well. And that's why I held that, that specific briefing. Those members who did not wish to attend that briefing, it's entirely up to you. It's not a requirement, but I feel comfortable that I've given all the relevant information that is required. And I believe that um, the proposal that we've put forward, the, the approach we've taken is appropriate. The, um, the $20 million saving that has been required of, of, of the administration to find out of our operational budget was a directive of council, sure. But when you look at our financial position, it is necessary. It is a necessary requirement. We simply have to look at ways of saving operational funds so that we can work towards rebalancing our budget. 
I believe we've got more work to do in the future, but it's something that we need to be aware of. And indeed, the budget has been arrived at, or our budget position has been arrived at for three reasons. That is seven years of zero rate in the dollar increases. That is um, um, the, the fact that we've had at least five years of aggressive infrastructure projects and projects um, being undertaken in partnership with the state government. And thirdly, the impact of COVID-19. As a capital city council, we are absolutely impacted by those three things and we've arrived at a financial position because of those. Now, I believe we have a duty and we have an ability to work through that, um, but it's going to require discipline and it's going to require effort to comply with our long-term financial management plan. On the 24th, we aim, we aim to provide you with a workshop where we're going to invite the chair of the audit committee to come in and talk to us and we're going to fully explore the financial challenges we have. And I hope that you will attend that and take note of the challenge ahead and what we need to do to address the situation. I believe that's achievable and I believe it's a responsible thing to do. Um, I just needed to clarify that with you. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, CEO. Uh, members, if not, go to the move to sum up. Councillor Martin. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, I, I refute absolutely that there has been anything more than a broad brush description of what was going to happen. A motion moved by the Deputy Lord Mayor to save $20 million, a proposal for a $14 million allocation for redundancies and also restructuring, which was in confidence, accidentally revealed, not part of the public consultation, not part of the public consultation, People were annoyed about that because it involves cuts to services. The administration's made it clear, cuts to staff, cuts to services. Those things have not been in the public arena. And this so-called restructure, the first of the detail I received was last night in an email from the CEO. Just as the advertiser went to print with the story, 400 jobs to go at the city of Adelaide. That is the extent of the consultation that's occurred in this city. So we're all focused on jobs. The intention of this motion is for us to sit down and consider other options. None of them have ever been presented to me. Never, not in committee. Now, I'll attend any committee meeting, any properly constituted meeting, but I have a grave issue with CEO briefings, and so does the parliament. These are meetings which are convened, I, I grant you, under the Local Government Act, but they are convened without an agenda, without minutes, without any recording, without any input being recorded by anyone. <coughs> that is not how a, a body that's concerned about transparency, about public benefit operates. It actually has meetings that are properly constituted. They may be in confidence. I get that. I understand if the CEO believes that matters are I confidential. Am, I am going to call a point of order because you keep talking about properly constituted and under the Local Government Act, we are able to and we will continue to have briefings by the CEO in formal gatherings, whether they be confidential or not, are well, covered within I'm, our local I'm government act as to how view. we can conduct our business. So it is not... Um, well, well, no, I understand. I can understand why you'd want to defend No, so it's vigorous. not a matter of defending. I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you what's in the act well, yeah, and the way that we can actually operate. Yeah, the cameras can see you too. Look. It is not appropriate for an organisation that's concerned to meet standards of transparency to have meetings that have no agenda, no minutes, no recording, no record. They never happen. That is not an appropriate way for the city to operate. And with a committee, a structure which has an agenda and it may have confidential sessions, there is a complete record and a record that's ultimately released for public consumption. They are vastly different exercises. And I take offence that these things are being done. Such important matters, such important matters as people's lives and the services we provide to the city are being discussed outside of that structure, which is the regular structure of the city of Adelaide. Members, to the vote, those in favour, those against, that is lost. Well, that's good. Those members voting in favour of the motion, please rise. Councillor Martin, Councillor Donovan and Councillor Sims. <coughs> yeah.
Yep, that's declared against. Um, 10.20, 10 uh, 2020 confident, uh, review of confidentiality orders. Okay. Sorry, um, Lord Mayor, do we have to deal with the, my apologies. the original? I'm happy to move. <laughs> my apologies, members, I turned the page. So that takes us back to the original motion. I look for a mover and a Deputy Lord Mayor and a seconder, Councillor Kouros. Deputy Lord, Lord Mayor, did you wish to speak no, to thank me? thank you. Councillor Kouros, members? If not, back to the move to summer. Summed up. Members to the vote, those in favour? Those against? Councillor Donovan, I didn't see you vote. In favour. Thank you, that is carried. Um, I'll now turn the page to uh, item 1020, which is the 2020 Review of Confidentiality Orders. I look for a mover, Deputy Lord Mayor, and a seconder. Councillor Knoll. Deputy Lord Mayor, did you wish to speak? Deputy Lord Mayor, did you wish to speak? Oh, sorry, no, thank you. Councillor Knoll, no members? Councillor Martin? Uh, can I ask the administration uh, if to avoid any possible breaches of confidentiality orders? that members are supplied with uh, the matters which have been released for confidentiality either on USB or disk as it used to be provided in the previous term of council or identified on paper. Uh, and I ask for that because uh, in the, uh, the case of 2019, there was a great deal of staff time consumed in trying to identify which order in uh, circumstances where many orders have the same name was the one which was released. released. Um, CEO? Through you, Lord Mayor, yes, we can, we can accommodate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, if not to the DLM, to sum up. No. Members to the vote, those in favour? Those against? Councillor uh, Martin? Favor. In favour? Thank you, that's carried. Uh, members, that takes us to item uh, 10.21, Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, Lord Mayor, I just wanted to declare that I, by virtue of the peculiar drafting of this, um, have a material conflict, uh, but it's only for part three, so I'd request that we take this in parts. Certainly. Thank you. Certainly. Uh, members, uh, were you moving the motion? I'll have to move yep. it. And a seconder? Sorry, can I can I move it if I'm going to pop out for part three? Uh, probably not. Probably I'll not. For, I'll look for another mover. Sorry, um, it, could I have a mover, members? Councillor Knoll and a seconder. Councillor High. Councillor Knoll, did you wish to speak to it? Councillor Knoll. Oh, sorry, Councillor High. No. Uh, members. Councillor Martin. Yeah, Lord Mayor, uh, um, you did say at committee something similar to this was your idea. Would you like to explain to us why you proposed this? My apologies, Councillor Martin. I was just getting some advice from governance. I didn't quite hear the question. Um, you disclosed and spoke very briefly at committee that you were responsible for this. Could you explain to me why you proposed it? Uh, I can explain to you, Councillor Martin. Um, this was a conversation that I had with the uh, with the CEO. Um, to me, it is worthwhile that we review every 12 months. We've actually been working under this standing order for 12 months, and I believe that it was time for us to see whether we wanted to rotate the committees again to give other members of council a chance and the opportunity to experience chairing of committees. It's very simple. So if you're rotating it and giving other people the, uh, the opportunity to chair committees, why are you proposing that the current chair for the last year continues in the role or are you only saying uh, until December? I didn't actually write the support report, Councillor Martin. In fact, I didn't see it until you did, which was um, in committee. Um, I think that was for continuity. I'd have to look to the writer of the report to see why that was asking for the current Deputy Lord Mayor to continue as chair. Through the Lord Mayor, part three of the recommendation only relates to an extension of Councillor Hyde until the 31st of December because it was determined for that to be a convenience thing, which would then also line it up with the appointment of the positions of the deputies. Uh, which council made uh, at an earlier council decision. I hope that answers your question, Councillor yeah, Martin. 
Uh, look, um, I, I know everybody has a view about this, Lord Mayor, but um, I do remember you saying that uh, we were combining the roles um, because it was a means by which um, you would be able to interact more closely with um, the Deputy Lord Mayor and Chair of the Committees. Um, and uh, I, I do remember the considerable fuss that was made about how savings were going to be made by combining these roles. Um, it, it was, I think, probably overstated, but nevertheless, in a circumstance where we are in such tight economic times, uh, it's uh, it's a saving. But look, more particularly, Lord Mayor, um, I, I think um, I, I would not want to be associated with a vote that suggested that the Deputy Lord Mayor um, is in no way able to chair these meetings. I think it's entirely appropriate. And I think the Deputy Lord Mayor has the capacity to do the job. Uh, and I think I'll, I'll be supporting her. And uh, I suggest all of you do by voting this down. I think that is fabulous to hear from you, Councillor Martin. This was in no way to cast any aspersions on whoever was going to be the Deputy Lord Mayor, even if it had continued to be Councillor Hyde. Um, and again, in terms of the budget savings, as I said, I didn't actually see the report before it went through. It was discussion as to a point in time where we might like to review uh, what we had decided the year before. Uh, members, with that, I'll go back to Councillor Canole to sum up. Members to the vote. Those sorry, in... sorry, Lord Mayor, are we taking that in parts? Oh, we're taking it in parts. Thank Absolutely. You. Sorry, apologies. Uh, if I could ask for us to vote on parts one, two, and four. Those in favour? I'll take that again. Those voting in favour of parts one, two, and four. Those in favour? Those. <laughs> can we? Can we? Uh, you look very undecided. I'm looking for those in favour of parts one, two, and four. Members. Those against? Councillor Ho, how are you voting? In favour. Councillor Donovan, how are you voting? Right. Uh, members, in terms of part three, um, those in favour? I'll just step in. <laughs> okay, conflict of interest. Uh, members? Sorry. Uh, no, we've summed up. We're not taking questions. I'm going to part three. Members, those in favour? Those against? Thank you. That is. Well, it's lost, actually. So, so all parts of this motion are lost. Thank you. Um, members, I have before us, there are five items, uh, or oh, six items. Yes, sorry, six items uh, presented for consideration in confidence. Each item will require a motion and decision to order the exclusion of public to enable consideration. Uh, members, I look for a mover and a seconder for 2.1.1, recommendations advice of the audit committee in confidence. Thank you, Councillor Abraham today, seconded Councillor Canoll. Members, to the vote, those in favour? Those against, that is carried. Uh, item 12.2.1, looking for a mover and seconder traffic signal maintenance contract extension. Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Abraham today. Members, if not, to the vote, those in favour? Those against? Councillor Kouros, how are you voting? That was 2.2.1 in favour, thank you. Uh, members, I need a move and seconder for item 12.2.2, the stables of Victoria Park leasing matter. Councillor Abraham today. Uh, seconder, Councillor Kira. Members, if not, members to the vote, those in favour? Those against, that is carried. Uh, item 12.2.3, assignment of lease. I look for a mover. Councillor Abraham today, second Deputy Lord Mayor. Uh, members, if not to the vote, those in favour? 
So it's against, that is carried. Item 12.2.4, Capital City Committee update. Councillor Abraham today, seconder. Councillor Canole, members. If not to the vote, those in favour, those against, that is carried. And item 12.2.5, appointment of chairperson and board member to Adelaide Economic Development Agency, Deputy Lord Mayor, seconder Councillor Mackey, members. If not to the vote, uh, those in favour, those against, that is carried. Um, thank you, uh, members and of the public and staff for your attendance uh, to this point and those not associated with items 12.1.1, 12.2.1, 12.2.2, 12.2.3, 12.2.4, 12.2.5, 12.2.6, 12.2.7, 12.2.8, 12.2.9, 12.2.10, 12.2.11, 12.2.12, 12.2.13, 12.2.14, 12.2.15, 12.2.16, 12.2.17, 12.2.18, 12.2.19, 12.2.20, 12.2.21, 12.2.22, 12.2.23, 12.2.24, 12.2.25, 12.2.26, 12.2.27, 12.2.28, 12.2.29, 12.2.30, 12.2.31, 12.2.32, 12.2.33, 12.2.34, 12.2.35, 12.2.36, 12.2.37, 12.2.38, 12.2.39, 12.2.40, 12.
is the Lord Mayor's. Oh, sorry, we'll just wait for the doors to be opened. Is uh, the Lord Mayor's report for November? Um, this week is NADOT week. I hope you all found your badges on your table when you came in. Um, and yesterday I had the pleasure of hosting morning tea in the Adelaide Town Hall, um, which also was a bit of a reflection on Council's continued recognition and celebration of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures in the City of Adelaide. Um, I unveiled digitally a stunning artwork by, uh, by Jamea Branson, which is now on display in Rundle Mall. Um, sadly, we actually had to cancel the Rundle Mall NADOC celebrations today because of bad weather. Um, but uh, there are celebrations all week. Um, we, I also presented this year's Lord Mayor of Adelaide's NADOC Award to Jack Buckskin in recognition of his incredible work to revitalise Ghana language through his teaching and song and dance, um, which is through his business, the Kamakura Cultural Service. And also Jack's had a, a long association with the City of Adelaide, uh, particularly around the dual naming of parklands uh, and in uh, teaching us some Ghana language. Um, he continues to support the City of Adelaide in the development of culturally inclusive practices, including the Welcome to Country and Smoking Ceremonies. And of course, he did our Welcome to Country Ceremony for our investiture. Uh, last week, I attended the South Australian Music Awards on behalf of the City of Adelaide to recognise and celebrate our extraordinary South Australian music industry. Adelaide is the first and only designated UNESCO City of Music uh, in Australia. Um, I, I will say, members, if you can have a look at the Music SA website, uh, there were some extraordinary artists and I was writing down the winners' names as we were presenting the awards and have actually been listening to the albums uh, uh, just during the week and I discovered one or two absolute favourites um, and I will call out the Wanderers who were um, just real deserving of the awards but um, there were some great awards and I uh, do endorse that for members to go and have a listen. Um, it has been a tough year for our arts and entertainment industries, probably an understatement, but it was really fantastic to congratulate these musicians and performers on their efforts and also the innovation that they did through COVID, which included live streaming a whole lot of music performances instead of um, live gigs, in-person gigs. Um, this month we've seen two of Adelaide's uh, favourite and iconic festivals return, uh, the Adelaide Film Festival and of course the Feast Festival, which are the first festivals to come back since COVID-19 reached us early this year. As part of the Film Festival, I had the pleasure of hosting a Q&A with filmmakers of Phil Liggett's The Voice of Cycling, Eleanor Sharp and Nicholas Bird, as well as attending the opening night and several screenings uh, during the festival. Feast Festival is now underway in the city, which is Adelaide's premier LGBTIQ arts festival. And last week, the city of Adelaide flew the rainbow flag outside the town hall to mark the beginning of Feast. Additionally, we've had the Vegan Festival in Rymel Park, as well as Chiefs Fest Gather and Graze. And it's wonderful to see the events coming back to the city and also how many people are attending those events. This month, we announced the winners of the City Awards, which we hold in partnership with News Corp to celebrate the extraordinary businesses that we have in our city. And again, it was wonderful to acknowledge their hard work and tenacity during this extremely challenging year. Um, we also added a new award, which was the Artisan Award. Um, I also hosted the round, uh, the, I think it was the second, possibly the third Hutt Street Roundtable this month. Um, the need to curate unique experiences in collaboration with our businesses on our main streets and precincts to attract visitors and residents is more important than ever. On the 28th of October, I laid a wreath at the National War Memorial with the new Italian Defence Attaché, Colonel Salvatore Cinconi and Consul Adriano Sten sorry, Stenardo. Um, on the 1st of November, I laid a wreath at the Greek Orthodox Community's commemoration of the 80th anniversary of Oxy, Ochi, Ochi, thank you, Councillor, Ochi Day. It was said so many times, I should know how to say that, Ochi Day, which means no, on the 1st of November. And the commemoration marks Greece's refusal to allow Mussolini to occupy Greece and their subsequent entry into World War II. As patron, I launched the Adelaide Rowing Club's 139th season. 
And of course, last Friday, I launched Pigeon in Rundle Mall. Could I have someone accept the report? Thank you, Councillor Sims, seconded by Councillor Kouros. Members, those in favour? Uh, I've already summed up, I think. Um, those in favour? Those against? Thank you, members, that's carried. Um, uh, item 14.1 is reports from council members. Councillor Kouros, uh, second Deputy Lord Mayor. Councillor Kouros, did you wish to speak? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I just want to um, let councillors know um, that I attended the um, LGA annual general meeting um, on the 29th of October 2020 this year. Um, now, uh, it was a very interesting experience, and I really, actually, I really did enjoy it. It was interesting to see or hear um, what other council councils' concerns and and what their um, <coughs> priorities are as a council. But, but with all that, we had uh, items on the agenda, of course, that, that were voted and some uh, the ones that passed was the attendance of, of meetings by um, electronic means, um, a solid waste levy, um, aluminium panel cladding, uh, regulation 119 of the planning development and infrastructure regulations 2017, the voter roll process, um, the buying it back circular uh, procurement pilot project um, they were all passed through um, but the uh, um, city of Adelaide had two items on the agenda we had the uh, to develop additional resources and programs to support employees um, and members that are impacted by family from domestic violence um, which was carried and it was uh, very very well supported uh, the second item that we had um, is that council we had a motion um, for that the LGA work with interested councils to develop a framework fostering greater uh, cross-council collaboration of shared social and other facilities and infrastructure, which was lost um, substantially. Um, so um, it wasn't something that was very favoured um, by other councils. Um, the uh, most interesting um, uh, aspect was the item um, seeking declaration of a state of climate emergency and development of an LGA climate emergency action plan. This was a very lengthy debate. It actually was about 45 minutes, um, but unfortunately it was uh, lost and uh, by a very a narrow margin. Um, there were a lot of, uh, uh, it wasn't that no one wanted to, uh, were, were denying about climate change, it was more the use of the word emergency, um, which is what um, was taking back a lot of the other councils and what that does constitute that it means. Um, of course, as under uh, council direction, we voted uh, for a climate emergency and I voted um, for this item. Um, I'd like to actually thank um, Susan Riddell, I hope I said that correctly. Um, um, she's here, but um, I like to thank her for all the work that she did in preparing me for this meeting and the direction that she gave me and all the information that she provided for me and um, and she made the experience all, all, all fun. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Corris. Thank you for representing us at the meeting. Members, any other comments on the reports? If not, Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, just to clarify, the word emergency wasn't actually in the motion that way. That's why I supported it. Um, uh, Lord Mayor, I just wanted to reiterate your, uh, on your point regarding the City Awards. I was very, very pleased uh, to see my local coffee shop uh, take out the award for best coffee. They are also number one on Bean Hunter. Um, that is, of course, Coffee Philosophy on Hutt Street. Uh, many people here have been treated to a coffee by me um, uh, at this particular coffee shop. It truly does have um, the best coffee, as it many of um, it truly does have uh, the best coffee uh, in the city of Adelaide. Uh, it certainly gets me going um, every morning and keeps me going well into the early hours of the morning as we're set to do uh, again this evening. Thank you, members. If I could have, that was your summing up. All those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Um, members? With the leave of the meeting, we'll have questions on notice taken as read. Um, they are on the website as usual and will be supplied members. With leave of the meeting, yes, hands, show of hands, thank you very much. Thank you. Questions on notice are read. Uh, members, that takes us to questions without notice. Councillor Martin. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm referring to the administration's responses to 15.6. Um, the allocation of funding for master plans uh, appears, and I am uncertain, which is why I'm seeking clarification, appears as though it will be consumed by matters other than master plans for the remainder of this term of council. Is that correct? CEO. Thanks, Clinton. Uh, through you, Lord Mayor. No, that's not correct. So is it medium or longer term? Because in the description, it talks about master plans being part of longer term thinking and then talks uh, also about medium term. So which one is it? Is it three years or one year or two years? Sorry, in terms of clarity, you're addressing the question to me, of course. Yes, so, I am. Yes. Yeah. So are you talking about how long it takes for the master plan to be done or how long no, what I'm just period of time the master plan addresses? I'm unclear of what the time frame is because the administration uses the language work towards the longer term thinking of a full master plan and then talks about it being possibly a medium term, medium term project. So I, I can't determine whether they mean one to three years or one to two years. Um, if it's uh, or one to three years. Uh, if it's the latter, uh, if it's the C former, it's not this term of council. If it's the latter, it's this term. CEO, could I ask? Yeah, you thanks, Clinton. Can you just thanks, me? Uh, through you, Lord Mayor. Um, I think I think the detail is in the response, councillor. Um, however, um, we have um, offered to provide a report to council um, and an update on exactly what we're going to deliver for the $232,000 that's included in this year's budget. Um, this year's budget is the uh, would be the exhausted budget for the master plan process. So we have an obligation to council to complete something by June 30th this financial year. Thank you. Uh, may I ask another question, Lord Mayor, a uh, follow-up? At 15.7, um, in response to the direct question, what is the ex the exit strategy which should have been triggered at the beginning of this year and when will it be implemented? Um, the administration says the primary objective is to continue negotiations. Does that mean it does not have an exit strategy or we, we just don't want to talk about it? See you. Thanks, Ian. Uh, back to the chair. I think we just remain incredibly confident, confident with the uh, proponent that we're in discussions with, including the recent presentation from them to councillors around um, their confidence in the project. I think the answer, uh, uh, councillor, is in number one. It's that given that we actually um, have got a preferred proponent and we're in a negotiation process, therefore it wouldn't be appropriate for us to trigger an exit strategy because we're in we're in negotiation. I, I understand that, Lord Mayor, but the Prudential report that Council Commission noted if development could not be established within two years of the $24 million purchase, that is by January 2020, then an exit strategy would need to be triggered. And my question is, what is that exit strategy and when will it be implemented, given that we're past the deadline? I do understand when it goes. Uh, it actually says if development certainty could not be established within two years, and within two years we did establish um, development certainty in going to a heads of agreement with the proponent is my understanding. Um, CEO. And so the relevant, the, the fact that the exit strategy is no longer relevant at this time. Uh, look, I, I do understand that, Lord Mayor, and I'm, I'm not being obtuse, but we don't have a development agreement. We have an agreement to negotiate towards a, de a development agreement. Uh, therefore, we don't have a development. That's that's the the nub of the question. Through Lord Mayor, I think it's been answered. Okay. Uh, members, that takes us to um, motions on notice. Councillor Sims, motion on notice divestment from fossil fuels, 17.1. Thanks, um, Lord Mayor. I move the um, motion as printed and seek a second. Councillor Martin. Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, I don't propose to uh, talk on this for long because we have uh, talked about this before on this council. And what I'm proposing 
um, is uh, the wording that came from an original um, recommendation um, that it was endorsed uh, by our audit committee. Um, it's a, a pretty conservative um, proposal when um, one considers uh, the implications because um, members will note that um, it is uh, subject to compliance with legislation, treasury uh, policy objectives and parameters, and a competitive return. The City of Adelaide preference investment securities and financial institutions which do not invest in fossil fuel in the fossil fuel industry. And Lord Mayor, that would be consistent with um, what more than 30 local governments have done around Australia. Indeed, since 2014, there's been a gradual increase of the number of um, local councils that are doing this. They include the City of Melbourne and the City of Sydney. Our city has such a proud record in terms of being an advocate for climate action, taking initiatives, uh, taking steps to make our city more sustainable. Um, and indeed, I think Adelaide is positioning itself as one of the, the world's leading green cities. And so it is only right that we should support a policy position such as this. And um, I hope that all councillors will come on board and support it. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor. Yeah, I just wondered if the administration could provide us uh, with a definition for divestment. CEO. Through you, Lord Mayor, I'm not sure we can, not here, Claire, any thoughts? In what context are you talking? Oh, the in, title. In the, the context of the title of the motion. <laughs> is it no longer investing or is it pulling your investments? I always understood it to be pulling your investments. If I read, uh, actually, I think there is confusion with the title. I agree with you, Deputy mm. Lord Mayor, but if you actually read the motion, it's will preference investment securities financial institutions. I know, which and do hence, not hence the confusion because I would have thought the title of the motion is politically motivated, but the policy itself is actually not the worst. So, so perhaps if we can. But I was confused. I was confused the, the, that I was missing something. That's yeah. all. So we're not divesting. We're just no longer investing in, so in accordance investing. with Treasury policy. So we won't. Okay. okay. I think I'm, I think I'm looking at. So it's not divestment. That's good. Um, uh, further questions. Uh, the um, uh, with regards to Treasury policy, um, can the administration remind me? At what point in our long-term financial plan uh, we will have debt paid down uh, to a point where we actually have funds to invest? CEO. Thanks, Blue. Um, so we, we hope to move um, to an operating surplus in 2024 um, and um, unless we can achieve that sooner. Um, we'll be working at that through, as Mark indicated tonight, through um, some scenarios for council members to consider um, in the coming weeks. Um, and once you're in operating surplus, um, we would then be using that to pay down debt. And so uh, post-2024, um, how many years will it be before we pay down our debt, which I think Councillor Martin highlighted would be over $100 million? Is that is that is, um, is that memory, forecast at all? Um, without anything changing at the moment, I think we're looking at I think it was twenty six years if we reach our maximum under the Treasury uh, policy years. in terms of borrowings. Um, if nothing changes in terms of revenue and expenditure, roughly from memory, but I can't, can't you know put my hand on my heart, but I think it's roughly twenty six years. That sorry, is that twenty six after twenty twenty four? That was or, the question. That, that was the question you asked. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. So it was twenty. So four. So thirty years. Okay. Sorry. Um, I'll I'll just speak briefly, um, Lord Mayor. Uh, first up, I'd like to uh, commend um, uh, Councillor Sims. This is a well constructed motion. Um, the administration have clearly been consulted uh, in its construction because it's worded well. It's clear. Uh, there aren't uh, any confusions about it. Um, but for the title, which obviously should have been vetted out. I know my motions, when I title them, they get changed um, for being too political. Um, but of course, we have had confirmed, Lord Mayor said it, this is not divestment, um, which leaves me infinitely more comfortable. 
um, uh, uh, but still not quite comfortable enough because Lord Mayor, 30 years, it'll be 30 years before we have $1 to invest. 30 years before we have $1 to invest. And of course, if you added up all the other initiatives Council Sims brings, it's probably add another 30 years onto that. But, um, uh, but, but 30 years, 30 years, I mean, I mean, fancy making, I mean, based on the rhetoric, Lord Mayor, we'll be dead by then. We would have died from climate emergency by then. Um, uh, or we would be choking on the fumes that our fossil fuel Thank cars Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. If um, you can three contain Lord, can yourself. I, can I just um, interject? Um, I just think it's important that so the information Claire gave was her best advice at this time. And it could could be corrected. So. Could be what, sorry? As sorry. in don't quote it because it is not substantiated. That's correct. So oh, a report that is here tonight. Of course, of course, of course. But, that, but, but, but in context, and that's the thing, in context, this motion will achieve nothing. And that's, that's the real unfortunate thing. This motion will achieve nothing. I'd at least have some more respect for the motion and for Councillor Sims, if, if he actually brought something um, uh, that would change the status quo, stick it to the man, um, uh, you know, stick it to the, the fossil fuel industry, that awful industry that creates tens of thousands of jobs, hundreds of thousands of jobs, in fact, in Australia, at a time when jobs are desperately, desperately needed. Um, uh, you know, Santos, uh, one of the few corporates with the headquarters here. Deputy uh, Lord Mayor, in can, we this is to, can we stick to the motion? Well, this motion would preclude us. us investing in a South Australian founded business that has stuck by South Australians through thick and thin. They are still here. Many other corporates are. Santos are still here. And, and this would stop us from investing in them in you potentially 30 you years time. Um, uh, and, and, I, and I think that's a bad thing. So while, while I, I, I'm very pleased that this motion is actually not divestment, it's preferential uh, uh, investment. investment. Um, and I'd, I'd be very happy to, if, you know, if, if we found a, the, gold, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, I'd be happy to consider investing some of that money in renewables. But this motion will achieve absolutely nothing. Um, uh, by the time this council uh, pays down all of its debt so that it will have funds to invest, um, uh, yeah, climate change either would have been fixed or will be dead. So um, I don't think this will achieve anything, and I think it's an awful motion that should be voted down. Councillor Kerr. Thanks, Lord Mayor. I'll be brief. Um, look, uh, the other thing, uh, on top of what the Deputy Lord Mayor said about this, um, the other, the other mischief uh, about this motion is, again, again, it, it comes back to the wording and to the title, and that word in particular, divestment, uh, because that word has been used as a bit of a, uh, as a, as a, bit of a missile that hides its, its real payload. Uh, this is not divestment. Divestment uh, is, for example, the, uh, the uh, contract for electricity uh, that we've all voted for. Uh, that with the procurement contract that will see 100% renewable energy. Let's not forget, we've all voted for that. Uh, that, that, that is divestment, uh, arguably. Uh, that, that is, uh, you know, something that will come incidentally at a cost to rate players. Um, and uh, I just incidentally, I do remind the CEO, we did have an undertaking about that to get a, uh, a comparison rating. But that's by the by. That is divestment. That's something we did. This isn't divestment. This is actually uh, activism. And this is the problem. Uh, you. You don't want government to overstep these boundaries for the same reason you don't want, uh, let's take a random example, you don't allow uh, the police uh, to uh, wiretap a, a clock. Uh, and this, this is relevant, Lord Mayor. This is I don't think it is. I'd, like, is you to see, I'd like you to talk Mayor. to Treasury Promise Policy with, and Investment in Fossil Fuels. With respect, this is fundamentally the problem here. This is about saying that we will not only uh, not invest directly in the, in, the, in the fossil fuel industry, which as Councillor, as Deputy Lord Mayor he says, that includes natural gas. And 30 years from now, who knows what that includes? Currently, it powers the schools and hospitals. But never mind that. The problem here is it says we will tell third party contractors, banks in this case, we will ask them to open up their books and tell us who do you do business with? This is a line of, of uh, activism by government that we should not cross for the same reason you don't allow wiretapping of clients with the lawyers. Uh, okay, it's a line you don't allow the state to cross. Okay, you may definitely catch more criminals if you do that. But the problem is that the devil is in what you have uh, allowed yourself to become in doing that. It is a very serious and very profound point, and it is actually 
really uh, important that we recognise what's buried in this. Uh, it, you know, you, you may be very profoundly against climate change, uh, against fossil fuels, but we did divest right. from fossil fuels. You, we did divest from fossil fuels with our procurement contracts, which may cost ratepayers. We don't know yet what, what the upshot of that will be. We made a profound decision then. This, uh, once again, one of the Sims merry-go-round, when this is the third time around uh, in this, this playground, but, but for the very same reason, this is a line we should not cross. Councillor Abraham today. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, uh, we, uh, we, well, I have uh, seen a number of financial institutions slowly move away from fossil fuels and, uh, I guess, uh, position themselves in a uh, uh, in, in a way to um, attract new clients. Now they're using this as a as a marketing tool, if you like, um, and sometimes it works. Um, I know there are. Uh, um, member-owned community banks out there such as Beyond Bank who go out there and do great work and that's the marketing tool that they use. So uh, I guess there are financial institutions that are using this to their benefit. Um, uh, but I guess, you know, for me, the other thing here is that um, I think about um, recently I've been thinking about the future generations. I think about what sort of an environment, I, I do, I think about the future That's generations because I think about the sort of environment that I'm going to leave behind, uh, you know, for my son, maybe uh, my grandchildren um, and, uh, and, and other generations. And so uh, I can already see us moving away from fossil fuels, going towards renewables. I can see financial institutions using this as a, as a marketing tool. I can, I can see the, the sway that, that's happening. Um, whilst I know that uh, uh, you know, this doesn't really deliver any outcomes, uh, it, it yeah. doesn't, uh, I'm, um, uh, uh, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna support it just, uh, uh, just so we can shut the debate, I'll stop seeing <laughs> these, these, these sorts of things from, from coming in. But also, but also I guess you know, in, in the long term, I know that uh, uh, you know the, the environment is not the not the uh, not the environment environment, but I guess you know the uh, the, um, uh, the the way in which we look at certain things like uh, you know where we invest, how we bank, who we bank with, who we do business with, whether if they're ethical or not. They're the sorts of things that are uh, uh, um, starting to be of importance to us. If it wasn't that important. Uh, these institutions wouldn't use it as a marketing tool and use it to, uh, uh, to, to grab more clients. So uh, even though there are no outcomes uh, with this, I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm still going uh, kind to of support it. Thank you, Councillor Mackey, then Councillor Knoll. Thank you, uh, Councillor Mayor. Um, I, I um, again, well, I note, um, as has been observed before, there, the word divestment does not appear in Councillor Sin's motion. It is, has been used as a headliner uh, by the administration, but it, it does not um, appear in the motion. And um, Sorry, just I do for clarification, the headline would have come I've from Councillor Sims, not administration. I've that, uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I meant no disrespect uh, to our, um, our administration. Um, there is no, nothing wrong in governance and public policy making to values signalling. It is values signalling that has driven the South Australian government's uh, move ever more and more to renewable energy, to wind and solar and, and battery, successive South Australian governments. Um, and uh, while I, I, I do somewhat wryly note the paradox uh, in completely supporting Council's uh, consistent moves toward clean and green. I, I, I do note that you know, there is a slight paradox that um, we are currently utterly dependent upon the internal combustion engine that drives customers into our car parks. Um, uh, but I, I, I choose not to make that a reason not to support this motion. Like uh, Councillor Abrahimza um, uh, we, we have a we have a narrative uh, for the city and increasingly for the state um, that is about clean and green. And um, uh, supporting this position is in some senses reminds me back in about 2001 when I was last on council and the then council uh, debated uh, declaring the city of Adelaide a nuclear free zone. 
in much the same way as many, many other cities around the country and, and local government around the country did so. It was a value signal. There's no question that in, in, probably in our lifetimes that we're going to see a nuclear plant uh, here. And, and it didn't it, uh, it didn't demur from the reality that in basements of hospitals, there are low grade nuclear materials sitting in, in, in hopefully safe storage. Uh, but it's a signaling of the values that we place on the future. And for that reason, I'll support the motion. Thank you, Councillor Mackey. Councillor Knoll. Um, noting the, the, you know, the time frame roughly that the uh, administration put on this side, I do look forward to uh, 2050 when we actually start to contribute uh, towards the, uh, you know, the listing of, of investment in fossil fuels. And I think our Australian government will actually meet us to actually doing something constructive. Uh, Councillor Kouros. Granted, we won't be able to actually implement this until 2060. But how about being that person that implemented this to, for a change back in 2020? That's what we want to be. We want to be leaders. We want to be leaders because we have in our strategic plan as well that we want to be leaders in the environment. So this is um, about policy making for the future. It's not about policy making for today. And it's about us taking leadership and being responsible for our environment. And as Councillor Mackey have pointed out, it does not it does not do anything other than create good policy in regards to respecting our environment and being leaders in this area. So granted, yes, it cannot be action today. Granted, it doesn't mean anything right up to, right as, uh, from tomorrow, but it could mean something for the future. And that's what we've got to be looking towards. We have to be looking towards the future. And that's what this is about. Councillor Martin. Oh, I just uh, want to congratulate uh, the Deputy Lord Mayor elect. That was uh, eloquently spoken, and I couldn't agree more. Um, and moreover, I look forward to our dealing with a large range of financial, financial institutions, which I like to think are acting ethically rather than adopting marketing ploys, although it may be a marketing ploy. Um, and they include uh, uh, institutions like the ANZ, which has just announced that it will no longer support uh, uh, companies involved in fossil fuels, uh, and our own Adelaide Bank. Um, these are uh, substantial institutions which have also made this decision. And I uh, thank Councillor Sims for his persistence and for bringing him back to this chamber. Uh, Councillor Sims to sum up. Thanks very much, Lord Mayor, and thank you um, to all elected members for their comments, in particular the Deputy um, Lord Mayor uh, elect. I think you've uh, nailed it, um, uh, Councillor Kouros, in terms of talking about the fact that this is an opportunity for us to do something today. And I do find some of the opposition to this a little bit confusing, Lord Mayor, because some members say we'll do nothing, and yet we must oppose it anyway. You can't really have it um, both ways, uh, or they can't really have it both ways, um, Lord Mayor. Uh, in terms of the, um, the discussion around um, the divestment title, just to be clear, um, this motion is very similar to the motions that were moved in the City of Sydney and Melbourne. They used very similar language um, around giving preference to alternatives, um, and that's the language that's been used in the divestment um, campaign as well. So, look, I'm um, hopeful that uh, Council will get behind this tonight. Um, <laughs> It has been a long time coming, Lord Mayor. I've said it many times before, but I'm a big believer in the Pantene effect in politics. It doesn't happen overnight, but it does happen. Um, and this is an opportunity for this council, I think, to take an action today that will have um, a, a long-term um, impact. And I think would be um, a big win for members of the community that have been campaigning on this for many years. And indeed, since I was on council in 2014, we have had members of the community come and talk to us about this issue over many, many years, and I thank them for their work. Members to the vote, those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Those members voting in favour of the motion, please rise and remain standing until your name has been called.
Councillor Abraham today, <laughs> Councillor Canole, Councillor Martin, Councillor Mackey, Councillor Kuros, Councillor Donovan and Councillor Sims. Members, uh, item 17.2, uh, which is the motion from Councillor Moran, will be placed on notice for the December meeting. That takes us to item 17.3, Councillor Martin, Bath and Terrace Landscaping. Um, yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. And you seconding, Deputy Lord Mayor? So, Councillor Martin. Uh, look, Lord Mayor, this is a request for a report. Um, I note the administration has included some figures about renewing curbing and guttering, and of course that would be nice, um, but the issue is really the one for ratepayers identified in the first and second parts of this. That is that we undertook a project in 2016-17, uh, there was a consultation, uh, in fact, I can't remember whether the CEO was on board at that time, but he went up there as well. Um, I saw him there, yep. And uh, we said to residents we would plant turf either side of the Parklands Trail uh, to both beautify the vista across to the golf course, but particularly to stop dust and grime blowing across what was then an area that was not turfed. Now, um, we actually uh, took care to show ratepayers exactly what we were doing. Here are the papers from 2016. You can see the arrows saying this is where we're going to turf. Here are the images we gave them showing them what it would look like turfed. Um, but we didn't. We did We did a bit. We didn't do much. Uh, and uh, we promised irrigated turf. Uh, we put the irrigation in all right. Uh, recycled water, which runs along the edge of the trees. Um, but it all sprays one way onto the golf course. Uh, it doesn't come 360 degrees around uh, to water the other area to support turf. So uh, the ratepayers, uh, the residents, want to know why can't we have a, a system that pivots right around and enables uh, turf to grow in the area. Now, this is not uh, something that is a uh, minor matter. Uh, for many of the residents of Barton Terrace. This is really uh, about a daily battle uh, with hay fever and other symptoms as a consequence of the dust kicking up because we have just left the area mulched, it dries out, and then all of the muck goes across the road, uh, disturbing people's uh, amenity and in some cases their health. Um, uh, I am asking, um, hear what the next steps are, if we can help, uh, and to ask the administration to come back with um, a proposal. Uh, that proposal may be we are una uh, unable to do something, or it may be that we can do something next year or the year after or whatever. Uh, I'm simply asking the administration to revisit uh, what is for the residents of Barton Terrace who are affected uh, unfinished business. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Deputy Lord Mayor, to speak, members? If not, back to Councillor Martin to sum up. Sorry, Members to the vote, those in favour, those against, that is carried. 17.4 uh, members, Councillor Abraham today, uh, partnership opportunities. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'll move the motion as printed, slightly varied, okay. uh, at point number four, and I seek a second. Deputy Lord Mayor, you've seen the um, uh, variation. Thank you, Councillor Abraham today. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, Lord Mayor, at a time where we've had uh, many, many challenges, uh, COVID-19 being the main one, uh, I've thought about uh, tackling the many challenges ahead of us uh, as, a, as a group rather than going at it alone. You know, we have an old saying uh, in my culture where we say, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So uh, this is uh, the intention of the motion, is to um, get anyone else on board who uh, wants to be a uh, that is thunder. That's thunder. Okay, that's teamwork up there. <laughs> um, so, Lord Mayor, uh, as, as I was saying, we want to try and uh, um, uh, tackle the many challenges that we have ahead of us as a as a group. Um, now, one of the things that I do want to uh, that I would like us to to explore is that um, we here at the City of Adelaide have many many strengths. Um, we've got uh, uh, efficient staff that are uh, proficient in many areas whether if it's um, running uh, uh, car parking facilities, 
whether if it's uh, uh, monitoring uh, on-street car parking, um, asset management, uh, information management, um, Tengig City being a prime example of that. Uh, so let's use those strengths and let's see whether if we can uh, uh, create some sort of um, uh, revenue out of them, but in partnering with other councils. And likewise, there might be some stuff that uh, we may not necessarily be um, so good at or uh, we may need some assistance with. Um, uh, we might want to reach out to some, some of these councils who might be doing some of those things uh, um, uh, more efficiently than us. So we want to reach out and, uh, uh, and see what they're doing or how they're doing it or, or whatever the, uh, uh, the, the agreement might be. Um, so really the intention of this motion is to explore those opportunities, uh, I guess for that, uh, for that report to come back into council so that we can actually sit down and have a look uh, and see what, uh, what the council's uh, uh, desires are and um, how we want to approach this. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, do you respect members? If not, Councillor Abraham today to sum up. Oh, I'm just going to speak briefly. Yes, please. just a second. This this is a, a, a this is a good motion. Uh, there is nothing wrong, and everything that is good about uh, reconsidering, uh, particularly at this juncture, uh, what uh, synergies there may be with neighbouring councils, uh, where how we can catalyse. Uh, effectively catalyze our geographical proximity with our councils. I know it's an ongoing thing the administration is mindful of, but there's every good reason at uh, this particular, given the reset we, we, we've had to go through uh, as a council and given this year uh, that, that we don't have a renewed focus on this. I think it's an excellent thing. It'd be great for uh, councillors in particular to be appraised uh, if there is work already going on in this field. It'd be great for us to be appraised. So I wholeheartedly support this motion. Thank you. Councillor Abraham today, Sam? Uh, just, just quickly thank administration for highlighting the, uh, uh, the number of um, uh, opportunities that uh, uh, are already uh, explored and, and are in place. Um, and I guess uh, just to um, highlight to members that I wanted us to start exploring uh, these opportunities with our neighbouring councils and then from there on um, seeing what other councils uh, are interested. So. Thank you. Members to the vote, those in favour, those against, that is carried. Uh, item 17.5, Deputy Lord Mayor, uh, motion on notice ratings policy. Uh, just move and seek a seconder. Uh, thank you, Councillor Kouros. Um, uh, it's a very straightforward motion. Um, uh, I understand the administration have scheduled to have generally speaking, the workshop on the rating policy. Um, but this specifically requests uh, that one part of the rating policy comes into us for feedback and consideration. Um, uh, that is the part of the policy that says, uh, while you're uh, developing, uh, while you're building your development, um, we'll come along and incrementally uh, rate you as you're building it. Um, the, the problem uh, that I fundamentally have with that um, well, there's two. There's two. There's two examples that I'll draw in. One is where a resident um, uh, who lived in the city uh, bought non-residential land that was building on it, and would then be zoned residential uh, after that. Or once it was complete, sorry, for rating purposes, it would be zoned as residential. Um, uh, residential rates are obviously uh, orders of magnitude cheaper. Um, uh, during construction, um, we came along and re-rated his property, which is going to be a home at the non-residential rate, um, a, a value added, and that resulted in, uh, in, a, in a substantial increase. Um, uh, and there was nothing that could be done. I took it to the CEO, he said it's a matter for the policy. Um, uh, so the policy clearly needs to change. Um, the other example is uh, a, a builder here in the city um, who has been working hard to keep his developments going uh, during COVID. Um, uh, we've come along and uh, re-rated his, you know, he's employing hundreds of people, um, keeping the construction uh, project going. It's all funded through debt, um, uh, but the project will be seen through to completion. Um, that person has had their property re-rated uh, and there's been an increase of tens of thousands of dollars on that. Um, even though that person's not seen any value from that property whatsoever. Um, and I understand in the workshop, we'll talk about the principles that underpin our rating policy. Um, the primary principle um, uh, is, is the, the value for the property that you get per square metre based on the rent that you can receive. Um, uh, and that's what the property is based on. But I would contend um, that when something is being built, you're not actually getting any value um, in that form from it. 
Uh, furthermore, as well, um, and just touching on that second example, I am very concerned about the state of um, uh, non-residential development in the city, commercial development in the city. Uh, we rely on commercial development. It underpins, uh, or previous commercial developments underpin almost 80% of our rate revenue. Um, I'm concerned that while we've seen things like home building and what have you steam ahead, um, uh, there are other parts of the construction sector which are lagging behind. Um, we're still hovering at, at I think, around 65% occupancy for um, uh, our, uh, our offices here in the city, and that's uh, a point of concern as well. And so I'd like to, I'd like us to unpack that policy and consider what we can do um, to potentially decrease the holding costs of people who are uh, still developing and will continue to develop. We could just have 20 seconds more before we get a power blackout. Um, uh, uh, as well, I think it's, I think it's timely for us to consider. Um, uh, who's paying rates within the city of Adelaide, who isn't paying rates within the city of Adelaide, um, uh, the number of properties and the nature of that business as well. Um, I know that we bandy around the figure of $8 million for universities. And look, good luck trying to get the act changed, but we at least need to get the message out there um, around who's paying what, who's not. Um, uh, I understand the state government have substantial land holdings as well. Um, and they also don't pay rates to us, um, yet we're still required to go and maintain the footpaths and the roads and everything and what have you. So uh, I think that's why I requested that information. I think we need to get that out there so that we can have a, I hate this word, but a conversation around it, but hopefully it will result in something. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Karost, do you wish to speak to it? Members? Councillor Martin? Uh, look, uh, Lord Mayor, I support this entirely, but I do remember that um, Councillor Abiad asked for the information on those organisations and their properties. Do we still have that? Um, I can answer that. We do, but that would be updated to this point. In fact, we've um, the uh, CEO and I've worked through some of that, those uh, rated properties just recently. And, and just for my own interest, can you remember what the figure was? I, 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 do I will report to it through this. No, I mean the old figure. I'm not worried about the new one. Not no. the old one, no. Okay. Don't recall, I'm sorry. Uh, members, if not Deputy Lord Mayor, to sum up. No. Members to the vote, those in favour, those against, that is carried. Um, that takes us, members, to 17.6, which is Councillor Martin Formula E. Um, look, uh, Lord Mayor, I think I'll withdraw this and reframe it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Martin. And you put it on notice for December? Sorry? You'll put the... Uh, I'll uh, reframe it. Thank you. Um, that leaves us with 17.7, uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, uh, Superloop 500 sponsorship funding. Uh, I move and seek a second. Thank you, Councillor Abraham today. Yes, DLM. Um, I think this is fairly self-explanatory. Um, uh, what we're doing uh, is through you, Lord Mayor, um, seeking clarification and seeking a guarantee, in fact, um, uh, that everything uh, that everything that went to the V8 supercars or the Adelaide 500 or whatever the uh, particular commercial arrangement was uh, would continue to flow to events within the city of Adelaide. Um, uh, I, I, look, the figure is commercial in confidence, I, as I understand it, and we'll probably never know how much the state government gave. Um, uh, you know, in, in the back alleys of Adelaide, I've heard $20 million bandied around. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if it's false. Certainly is a lot of money, um, considering the net economic benefit was only uh, 38 as far as uptick to state product goes. However, um, whatever it was, uh, we need that in the city of Adelaide. Um, uh, it's clear that we need to bring events here. It's very, it's very sad to see that the um, a tour down under is cancelled for the upcoming year. Um, and while I commend our teams for working with events and trying to make sure they can still happen, um, there's a lot of things that won't be happening. Um, uh, and so I would like to see that support still offered to the City of Adelaide, um, uh, and, or to, to events within the City of Adelaide, but potentially to the City of Adelaide itself, because um, I think we do a fantastic job uh, encouraging events, helping them set up, bringing them here, um, and would probably do a better job than uh, some other state government agencies as well. Um, so potentially that money could go a little bit further if it was coming to us. Councillor Abraham today. Uh, just briefly hoping that uh, uh, the activities that we're asking for will fuel the local economy. 
Councillor Cross, I did see your hand. I'm sorry. It was, did you wish to speak? No. Um, thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, I wonder whether you might like to also, uh, either through this um, or separately, add it to the Capital City agenda for discussion for the December meeting? Um, I, I don't think it needs to be in there, but I'm happy for it to be added. I'll be so sending a feel, notice. Do you feel that we need it? Uh, no, we can do this and then have it on, but I do think it should be an agenda uh, item for Capital City I, in I December. Concur. I concur. So perhaps members, we might have that discussion when we do the call for agenda items. Um, uh, Deputy Lord Mayor to sum up. Members to the vote, those in favour? Those against, that is carried. Members, are there any motions without notice this evening? Uh, um, <laughs> uh, uh, on that note, uh, members, I declare the evening's meeting closed uh, and thank you for your attendance this evening. It is 9.24. Thank you very much.